Good afternoon and welcome to the final live webinar for European Public Health Week organised by the European Public Health Association's Urban Public Health Section and the University of Manchester. Today we've got quite a packed schedule and um, shortly after the first talk we will have um, We'll have a talk by Professor Luis Saboga Nunes, who is the Section President on Health Promotion at the European Public Health Association. He'll be talking about Grow Old, Grow Healthy, a paradox or a parody, from Homo sapiens to Homo salus and the proxy cause of the last human shakeup. Following that will be Andrew Rogers, who's a lecturer at the University of Manchester, and he'll be talking about COVID-19 implications on health promotion followed by Dr. Scott Weaver, an associate professor from Georgia State University, who will be talking about electronic nicotine disp dispenser systems and harm reduction potential, the story of the US smoker. And finally, we'll have Dr. Yannette Thomas, who's a strategic advisor for health of women and girls to the women's economic imperative and associate editor for women and girls, cities and health. And she'll be talking about healthy women and girls, healthy communities, post COVID-19 and beyond. And first, I'd just like to invite Dr. Teen Buffel to start us off today. Um, Teen is a senior lecturer in sociology at the University of Manchester, where she directs the Manchester Urban Aging Research Group, which is an inter interdisciplinary group bringing together scholars uh, with an interest in understanding the relationship between population, aging and urbanisation. And she's just going to deliver a talk on ageing in urban environments, developing age-friendly cities post-COVID-19. So I'd like to invite you to share your screen now, team. Okay, I think that's working now. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. So I am Tina Buffel and I work at the University of Manchester. Uh, my talk is going to focus on aging in urban environments. And I have had this particular interest in the issue of developing age-friendly cities. And uh, part of my talk is going to <clears throat> include some reflections on what that might mean in the current uh, context. So I will start my talk with a bit of context uh, about the demographic trends which are shaping um, the interest um, I will be sharing. And then I will talk about what has been termed the age-friendly movement and the idea of developing age-friendly cities and communities. I will discuss or summarize what I consider to be the main achievements of this movement and also highlight some of the challenges um, that are arising uh, for age-friendly initiatives at the time of the pandemic. Um, and I will conclude with what I would think is a way forward or a kind of plan of action in terms of developing an age-friendly agenda in, um, during the pandemic. So as a start, um, as Greg already said, I lead a group in Manchester called the Manchester Urban Aging Research Group. And we have a very particular interest to study and understand the interaction between population aging on the one hand and urbanization on the other from a range of different disciplinary perspectives. And we focus on do, do, to, um, those two trends because these are the dominant trends of the 21st century uh, with their interactions raising issues for all sectors of society uh, from labor markets to the demands of good, uh, goods and services such as um, housing transportation as well as uh, implications for family structures and intergenerational ties and this um, slide uh, shows some of the key uh, figures showing, for example, that 58% of the population aged 65 and over in the world lives in cities and towns, with more than half the number of those living in the global south. We also know that actually people aged 60 and over are the fastest growing cohort of urban populations. So demographic change is occurring uh, in many cases more rapidly than actually cities are able to respond or adapt to this um, demographic reality. 
But whilst population aging is a global phenomenon, it impacts differently on different cities. And this is a, a graph from a project where we looked at selected cities, which shows the, the, the great variation in the proportion of people aged 65 and over with on the right hand side, um, Akita, as well as other Japanese cities, which already have a third of their population age 65 and over. And on the left hand side, um, a number of European cities that have a very young uh, profile, which are aging slowly. Within the middle, cities like Brno in Czech Republic, which are young cities, but are actually aging very rapidly. A framework that has united a number of cities um, in Europe and in the Western world comes from the idea of um, supporting aging in place. And this is kind of a dominant policy framework that has been adopted as one way of responding to the challenges and opportunities arising from population aging in, uh, in cities. And aging in place um, can be defined as the idea to support older people and people to remain in their homes and communities for as long as possible um, by providing appropriate services, support and assistance. And of course, the whole idea of aging in place is, is very much driven um, on the one hand by financial concerns over the cost of nursing homes and residential homes. But research has also um, shown that um, uh, the, the large majority of people, older people themselves have a preference for to age in place in their own homes and communities for, for as long as possible. And building on this idea of aging in place, a number of models have arisen, have, have arisen across the years to support um, people to age in place. And one of the influential models has come from the World Health Organization, who developed um, the idea of developing age-friendly cities. Um, and an age-friendly city is defined as an inclusive and accessible community environment that optimizes opportunities for health participation and security for all people in order that quality of life and dignity are ensured as people aged age. And this definition uh, developed by the World Health Organization was uh, formulated on the basis of research which it conducted in the early 2000s across a number of cities across the world which highlight a number of common themes and domains of what would an, what an age-friendly city um, consists, um, building upon the needs and preferences of older people, as well as carers and um, community stakeholders. And these domains included aspects of both the physical environment and the social environments. Um, examples being providing adequate and uh, adaptive housing, uh, accessible transportation, inviting outdoor spaces and buildings, promoting opportunities for social participation, civic participation, as well as um, providing uh, opportunities uh, for adequate communication and information. And building on this model of the age-friendly city, the World Health Organization launched a network um, in 2010 called the Global Network of Age-Friendly Cities and Communities. And whereas the network started in 2010 with a handful of cities across the world, it very rapidly um, uh, expanded, with now in 2020 over 1,000 members that are committed to making their cities more age-friendly in terms of all these different domains. And Manchester, um, was one of those first five cities to be a member of the global network. Uh, it was the first city in the UK that became uh, an age-friendly city, showing the commitment towards improving um, the city and neighborhoods um, to improve the quality of life of older people. And the reason why Manchester was one of the first cities to become a part of this network was because there had been a tradition since the 19th of 90s of working and developing different mechanisms for different groups of older people and older people's organizations to be involved in decision making and policy making in um, 
in city in the city uh, for example through an older people's board but also um, a forum where different um, uh, groups of residents and community organizations could formulate uh, concerns uh, and and possible projects to be considered by by the council and those projects were very much focused on um, improving the lives of older people in deprived urban neighborhoods. Um, so age friendly neighborhood working has been quite a strong has had quite a strong focus with um, locally based uh, or place based partnerships between different community organizations, uh, group resident groups, uh, care organizations um, working together around creating age-friendly principles in particular neighborhoods. In Manchester, there has also been a very strong tradition of um, uh, research having a place in, in the whole debate about age-friendliness. And there is a strong partnership, for example, between the group I am leading and the city council, as well as the Greater Manchester Region, which I will talk about later. But one of the outcomes, for example, has been a project which I led a couple of years ago where um, we trained all the residents living in deprived neighborhoods to become co-researchers. And so people were trained in all aspects of um, uh, conducting research from designing a research project to um, uh, data collection to data analysis. And the aim of this project was to find out what different groups of people with a particular focus on older people who were experiencing social isolation um, were identifying as areas that could be improved to make their own neighborhoods more age friendly. And these are some of the outputs presented on the slides we have made together with the co-researchers a little film about the project. We've also written um, a couple of um, leaflets and this is an example of a book that we wrote together um, showing some of the potential areas uh, and, and some of the changes that this project has made in the community. Um, building on, on, on the work of um, Manchester City, there has also been an expanding interest in uh, the region um, with Greater Manchester becoming the first UK age-friendly region to be a member of the global network um, of age-friendly cities and communities. And this was, uh, this built upon collaborations with uh, organizations such as the Center for Aging Better, whereby a number of projects on the different age-friendly domains were um, developed, for example, around housing, employment for the over 50s and so on. There were also a number of projects uh, focusing on tackling social isolation in the private neighborhoods in Greater Manchester with um, quite a large scale project called the Ambition for Aging program, which received the 10.2 million um, grant from the uh, big lottery funding to organize projects at the local level, which were aimed at tackling social isolation. The Greater Manchester Age Friendly Region uh, commitment also built upon uh, the work that has been developed in what is called the Greater Manchester Aging Hub, which is a, a meeting space where different strategic leaders are coming together from um, public transport, housing, different areas to develop strategic responses to population aging in the region. And universities and researchers, part uh, a couple of people of our group are also uh, representative in, in this um, Greater Manchester Aging Hub. So partnerships again with research and university have been important in um, developing this work, who has also been very much supported by um, the mayor of Greater Manchester, who is presenting on the left hand side um, picture in one of the conferences on doing aging differently. So um, over the years, uh, colleagues of mine uh, and, and I have written a couple of papers which actually have a very critical perspective on the achievements of the movement, but also especially about, uh, around the challenges and the issues that the movement is facing. Face, um, facing. 
But I think there are a couple of uh, achievements that can be mentioned uh, despite those um, challenges. And I think the most important are those around um, achieving a greater recognition in urban planning of the implications of population aging. And this is not something that is just related to Manchester. I think a number of age-friendly cities across the world have shown that uh, age-friendly initiatives can make a difference in terms of redesigning outdoor spaces, improving transportation uh, in partnership with all the residents in the city. Um, a second achievement I think comes from uh, the involvement of organizations, networks uh, at different levels. Um, internationally, I've, I've mentioned the World Health Organization, but also nationally, regionally, and local. At local gov governments, the age friendly agenda has created or stimulated partnerships and collaborations around um, aging issues, which um, have been able to make a difference at different levels. And finally, um, and a third key achievement, which I would um, say of the age friendly movement, it is that it has been able to develop interventions which are focused on supporting the empowerment of older people within low income neighborhoods. And I think here Manchester has been really kind of taking the lead in um, developing questions and, and approaches to how initiatives can be developed in uh, neighborhoods facing um, particular challenges arising from deprivation and poverty. And I think in a way, um, you could say that the current pandemic will in a way stress test the extent to which age-friendly initiatives will be able to make a difference uh, in terms of um, older people maintaining a sense of um, quality of life um, and this will be particularly challenging uh, in the context of um, deprived urban neighborhoods um, because looking at the research out there it's very clear that where you live matters greatly for the quality of life in old age and in that respect i think the latest evidence um, if we look for example at the marmot review um, that recently came out um, the, there is quite bleak evidence of how it, many areas in um, in England have um, faced increased deprivation over the last uh, ten years, um, showing that also health inequalities between poor and rich neighbourhoods have increased over the last ten years, which are largely the effects of a decade of austerity, which is of course compounding the impact of um, the virus in many ways. Um, other research where I have been involved in also has shown that there is a causal relationship, and, and this research is based upon the English longitudinal um, study, that there is a causal relationship be between neighborhood uh, deprivation and social exclusion and isolation in later life. Uh, with older people living in um, deprived neighborhoods having higher um, levels of exclusion from services, from amenities, uh, higher levels of exclusion from leisure participation, cultural participation, and um, higher levels of exclusion from contact with family and friends. Um, and, a, and a third kind of uh, important finding um, in, in that respect, which is, is especially, I think, important in the current context is that nearly three quarters of a million people over 75 um, in England are, um, are living in non, what is termed non-decent homes or homes which present hazards posing a risk to health and safety. Um, and this is a higher proportion than any other um, age group. And I think these kind of findings are now um, um, urging us to look at the importance of, you know, where you live in old age being uh, becoming even more important. And the latest research from the Office of, uh, of National Statistics has also shown that where you live also really matters for how, whether you are protected from COVID-19 showing that people of all ages living in more deprived areas in England have experienced COVID mortality rates 
more than double those that are living in the uh, less deprived areas. Um, so I think if, if you think about these findings and relate that to ideas around how to develop age-friendly um, communities, I think it is important to say that age-friendly initiatives are probably the most urgently needed in areas where there is actually the least infrastructure to develop such initiatives because poorer communities have been hit hard, especially hard by cuts in public services. There has been uh, a loss in social infrastructure uh, as a result of a decade of austerity with uh, libraries uh, disappearing, day can, daycare centers disappearing, social clubs disappearing, all of which show that there is a decline in community social capital, which is actually currently limiting the capacity to mobilize resources to reach out to those groups of older people who seem to be most at risk during the pandemic. And a recent, uh, a recent report uh, from uh, the network of voluntary organizations came out showing that actually key areas of support provided through volunteer, voluntary organizations and food banks are already being lost. And there is a substantial income loss for the charity sector as a result of the lockdown. So based upon these um, findings, I think there's a couple of areas where we can think about in terms of developing an age-friendly agenda um, in the context of COVID-19. And I think the most important will be to strengthen social resources in areas of multiple deprivation. So I think here um, having injections uh, in terms of finances and developing a kind of community development policy to assist those particular neighborhoods will be especially important to prevent the effects of extreme social isolation and reach out, reaching out to the most vulnerable groups of older people in the community. And I think one um, suggestion made by colleagues in the US, um, De Biasi, Wolf and others, about developing, developing a kind of age-friendly public health system here will be important, whereby place-based partnerships are mobilized, um, which you know, have the potential to break down existing silos between services, community networks, groups, senior centers, to work together, collaborate in identifying, detecting the most vulnerable and as well as providing um, support and services to this, those people. Um, I think it will also be important to think about how we can de develop new ways of maintaining social connections. And I think here it's important to think this true that this is this should not only just be an online um, uh, development, um, especially if we if we know that 11.5 million of the people in the UK lack digital skills, around half of which is um, belongs to the population age 65 and over. So I think this is uh, going to be an important area. And finally, I think the um, we, we need to kind of think through how we can keep challenging discrimination uh, because research has already shown that the coronavirus is disproportionately affecting groups based on age, ethnicity, gender, class, sexual orientation. Um, so COVID-19 is highlighting existing inequalities, in many cases exacerbating those inequalities. Um, and if, if you think about aging issues, continued social distancing um, is likely to reinforce uh, ageism and age-based uh, divisions within communities. And given the risk of this age segregation, I think um, it will be essential to think through how we can foster uh, contact between generations, um, challenge ageist stereotypes, highlight the diversity of experiences within aging populations, and finally also work with 
um, equality organizations to support older people facing intersecting pressures of aging, racism, sexism, and um, other types of discriminations and inequality. Thank you very much. Sorry, I ran over time a little bit. That's not a problem. Thank you very much for that presentation. And um, we've got quite a few questions and I, I do think you touched upon some of them as you went further into it, but I'll ask them anyway. Um, so the first one is, do you see any challenges with the effect of migrant people returning back to their home cities for the latter years where they may have issues integrating back into their original culture? Do you want me to take a few questions and then... Yes, yeah, do you want me to read a few yeah. out? There's another one asking, um, do you see areas of age-friendly cities that can be transferred to rural areas? Um, another one asks, we often focus on inequalities between older people and younger people, such as the digital divide, but do you find issues with inequalities between older people and how do we address these? I'll ask them and then there's a couple yeah. about COVID that I'll come to after them. Yeah. Um, I think in, in terms of the, the migrant issue, um, if I'm honest, I haven't thought through about the idea of moving back, but obviously moving will continue to be a challenge over the next um, um, time. But um, I think if we, if we look at the migrant issue, it is important to look at the evidence that is emerging at the moment in terms of the ethnic inequalities uh, in relation to COVID-19 and there has been evidence from the US and now increasingly from the UK already that um, people from uh, different ethnic groups are dying at disproportional rates um, and there are colleagues such as um, Laya Bekaris, James Nasru, who are looking at a, a range of different explanations um, as to why this is the case and many of those explanations are linked to the structural inequalities which I have mentioned before um, uh, which I think are important to 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 understand uh, if we look at um, findings around how different groups are disproportionately affected and this kind of also links with the other question around um, inequalities um, and, and I think this is, I think, one of the points that I, I do want to make in, in this presentation, that indeed the inequalities within the aging population are very important to look at and that it's actually not only age that is an important determinant of how people are affected um, by COVID-19 um, and that it's a, a, a combination of structural inequalities such as race and class um, and gender that is actually equally important and that it's not just something that we should look at um, from an age perspective. And I think the way in which the discourse and narrative has been <coughs> evolving, <coughs> sorry, um, has, ha has, has already shown that there is a massive issue with, with um, um, you know, approaching and presenting older people in a way that is going to increase age-based divisions um, between different generations. Uh, and I think, you know, that there is a need really to think about alter alternative ways of uh, presenting older people as the, you know, a burden to social care, pensions and healthcare systems. And now increasingly also being the ones who are vulnerable to the virus. Um, uh, and, and, you know, therefore, um, older, presenting older people as uh, a homogenous, um, vulnerable group, I think, is, is a real problem uh, within the, the current debate. And then the issue around uh, age-friendly uh, communities in rural areas, um, I think that's a really good question and has actually been increasingly been uh, the focus of attention in a number of um, communities across the world where uh, different challenges have been identified uh, in terms of the domains around accessing health um, services, amenities. Um, and there have been a number of examples of how um, age-friendly communities can be developed in rural areas. 
Um, there are examples, um, uh, colleagues like uh, Kieran Walsh uh, is working around this issue in Ireland, for example. Um, there's examples uh, coming from colleagues like uh, Jenny Warburton in Australia and Nora Keating is um, developing a really strong program of work around developing age-friendly communities in rural Canada as well. Um, personally, I, I, I am, you know, I have been more focused in my research on the urban uh, side of things, but I do agree that, you know, thinking through what it means to age in, in rural communities is, is equally important. Thank you very much. And I'll just end before we go to Louis, I'll just end on a couple of more COVID related questions again. Um, so as services are going to be increasingly at a distance post COVID, how do you think this will impact on older people? And also another question is, um, many people are concerned about the drop in admissions to hospital for non-COVID related illnesses, with the elderly being disproportionately affected. How can we raise their confidence to seek healthcare during the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I mean, these are really important questions. Um, and I think in a way I'm really worried that after this disaster, another disaster will unfold um, about, you know, um, how different groups have been affected. Um, in terms of developing services um i think there's no one one answer to that one but what i have been particularly interested in is to think through how you can organize services in those communities who are most deprived where um digital exclusion is extremely high where there is no social infrastructure um, to kind of um, mobilize existing resources. And I think what, what we have kind of been thinking through is that there is an urgent need for governments to develop a kind of community in crisis fund to ensure that existing services, um, existing voluntary organizations and the charity sector, which are currently incredibly struggling and have been facing um, a, a number of pressures in terms of their income and financial resources um, to uh, enable those different networks, organizations to work together and develop strategies for accessing, detecting the most vulnerable groups and um, providing services um, that, you know, can um, look at the most pressing needs. I mean, one of the things that uh, uh, we know is that there is an estimation of one on uh, 10 old, uh, older people that are malnourished or at risk of uh, malnourishment. So this is like a, an, an immediate example of a pressing need where we will have to think through um, how different um, services, organizations, groups, um, can work together and I think um, investing in particular areas where this is going to be the most challenging is, is I think a very pressing um, need. Thank you very much and thanks for that talk. Uh, I'm now going to invite Louis to um, come and share his screen and talk. Um, so we're just going to have a talk from uh, Professor Louis Saboga Nunes, and he's an associate professor at the Institute of Sociology at the University of Education Freiburg in Germany. He's also the president of the health promotion section of the European Public Health Association. Thanks, Louis. You just unmute there, Louis. I'll just unmute you. Yeah. Oh. Thank you very much, Greg, and also Tim, for your presentation. And um, I would like to invite you um, to consider some issues that we today are dealing and that somehow have also been introduced by um, Tim. And uh, therefore, I just uh, would like to share with you my screen so that we can. Uh, communicate in a different way. Um, so when we, we think about growing old and also growing healthy, uh, this helps us to relocate a discussion that somehow is emerging everywhere. And that is related to the fact that we have 
a huge problem concerning the values that we have been building our societies during the last years. So that's why I would like to propose to you that we reflect on this transition from the Homo sapiens to the Homo salus. And I think that the COVID-19 has been a proxy cause that really we are in the beginning of a uh, human shakeup. And this shakeup, either it will prompt us to new levels of uh, human dignity, or this will just be another uh, um, story of exclusion and uh, um, parody uh, when we consider the human existence. So when we, we look at uh, living longer, um, you, I think you are aware of the, one of the most interesting researches done by a journalist that found out that there are several points in the world that he called the blue zones, where people are living longer and healthier. And some of these uh, zones uh, are located also in different continents. So there are some patterns that can be found here, like for instance, Okinawa, Icara in Greece, Sardinia in Italy, Nicosia in Costa Rica, or Loma Linda in California. And some of the conclusions that come up is that yes, uh, growing gold uh, is related to move naturally, uh, have and belong to the right tribe, have a right outlook and eat wisely. So when we, we look and consider these uh, conditions and then we go into the details how all this is immersed in the communities that uh, live longer and healthier, we come to some very interesting uh, questions. And, and of course, these questions are questions that concern us today. Uh, these also are questions that could be a way with the COVID-19 crisis to wake up, up to what are the real challenges that we are facing today. This is a lady from uh, um, uh, North America in California that belongs to one of these groups and the, when you read the stories of these people, you come up very easily that the decisions that can be made are decisions that can be done at the community level, of course, but they are individual decisions. And these decisions will increment the capacity of communities to really grow hold. And here is one, one picture of what is a common uh, meeting in Sardinians. Um, so the honor the family is one of the top high level issues in this community. And when we look at how the Sardinians are doing related to the COVID-19, there, there are some differences. And uh, this is a strike evidence that somehow these blue zones not only can help us grow old, but they can us help grow healthy. Uh, I just invite you to read through this because really that these are very interesting findings related to this crisis that we are all in, in immersed today. Now, grow healthy. What does that really mean? You know, I think every one of us has an interpretation, a definition of, of what it means to grow healthy. And I like to go back some ages ago and look at some of the conceptions that have been there uh, and that clarify somehow that the idea of growing healthy is not something new in the humanity uh, settings that we have today. And uh, when, when we try to understand what connects the different communities and different um, phases of human history, um, we, we come to very interesting uh, conclusions. And I just put one of them here all their life was spent not in laws, statutes or rules, but according to their own free will and pleasure. So this is utopia, we could say. Yeah, but this utopia has led these philosophers to think on how and what does it really mean to grow healthy during your life span. Um, so, uh, Hable introduces us to this concept of do what thou wilt. 
So because men are free. So grow healthy means to be free. They are well-born, well-breed, and conversant in, in honest companies have natural and instinct and spur and prompted them into virtuous actions and withdraws them from vice, which is called honor. So Hadley invites us to consider that when we are looking at science as an answer to live without conscience, we might come to a condition of the ruin of the soul. And what is then conscience? So conscience are integrity, principles, it's the difference between what is right and wrong, ethics, morality, scruples. I would say that when we look at what is going on in the world today and the consequences of this coronavirus crisis, we might find some of these key topics of Harvey as a consequence of degradation of some situation in several human groups. Integrity, principles, sense of right and wrong, ethics, morality, scruples. So all of these help us to understand that somehow, as we have been defined by the Homo sapiens, and during these last 20, 260 years, what have we been doing to grow healthy? And what has been the consequences of these wise men that was introduced by Carl Williams in 1758? So, where did we come with this Homo sapiens? Well, this Homo sapiens has been able to increment inequality in a way that some say has never been seen in the world before. This Homo sapiens has been able to destroy 80% of the wild mammals, 80% of the marine mammals, 50% of the plants. This wise man has been able to look at the other species, but not only at the other species, but at the other humans, and create a opinion of difference. And Charles Darwin put it quite well. In the struggle for the survival, these wise men, the fittest win out of the expense of their rivals because they succeed in adapting themselves best to their environment. One question that we could pose today is, those who are dying of the COVID-19 are part of those that they have not been able to really adapt to the environment. And therefore, if they go, they go. This is a very profound question that we have to pose ourselves today. As we can see that some of the leaders of the world today are somehow introducing this kind of natural selection. And uh, Martin Luther King just help us to re put again the discussion on the morality of what are the decisions behind some of the, some of the leaders that in the world today take the front uh, lead on the crisis. So of all inequalities, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhuman. When you come to a position, when you come to a situation, when you have to decide if you make someone leave and you disconnect the machine from another one, you are just facing what these inequalities might mean. And uh, one of the fractures in society of these inequalities is when we come to the old age, to the senior uh, citizens. So the senior citizens are somehow included in this concept that Charles Darwin also introduced in this discussion. If the misery of the poor be caused not by the laws of nature, but by our own institutions, then great is our sin. You know, I, I like to think about these concepts of the misery of the poor, because we know already the poor are those who are suffering the most with this crisis. So if the misery of the poor is caused by the laws of nature, just let it go. That's where nature makes the natural selection. But if the misery of the poor is created by our own institutions, then we have a problem. 
So we only start to have a problem when we consider that we are having, we are creating the misery of the poor by our institution. Now, when you look at the Sardinians, let me come back again to that blue zone, and we see how the Sardinians deal with the senior population. They don't send them to homes where they pack together their, they just keep them in their houses, living with two or three generations together. So we could talk here about the institutionalization of the senior population. Okay, so if we take care about the institutions and then therefore those seniors are not able to survive, we have, we have kept our obligation, our mandate. But what about the misery of the poor that is caused by the, na the natural laws? So with this, I just would like to propose you that indeed Homo sapiens is not at all sustainable. And since it is not at all sustainable, either we face the consequences of this um, way of thinking, of marginalization, of exclusion, of selection, and justifying by these means that we don't have the means to go after all the needs of all those that are the weakest link in our societies, or we stop and we start thinking from the ethical standpoint, from the morality, from what is wrong and good, if we are deep going the right path. So my proposal is that we should maybe take the opportunity of the COVID-19 to make a change and going from homo sapiens to homo salus. So as you know, the, the word salus means health in Latin. And the proposal is that if you go back to 2016, to the Shanghai Declaration of Health Promotion, you will see these 17 areas that are covered by this main concept of health and the pursuit of health and promoting health through the promoting of sustainable development objectives. So how can we really look at from the perspective of health promotion into what the growth healthy means in our societies today? Well, not much. So we really need to, to make a change, a shift. First of all, the insectuality approach, then the sustainability, then we have empowerment and public engagement, equity, and the life course perspective. Because of time is not that much, I will just focus now on one of these, and it will be on the equity. You see, we have a social issue here. We have a social problem, a civilization problem, when we come to terms and we start talking about equity. We, our, I would consider now the societies that are, are living or abiding by the principles of democracy. In democracy, equity don't find a place. Because the founding principles of democracy are egalité, fraternité, et liberté. And these principles, they favor the best fit in order to survive in this society. So the, the very basic principle of egalité is at the root of our democracy. And what does it mean? Well, it means that we are sharing equally with the members of society in order to establish equality. Now, at the foot, at the foundation of health promotion, we have equity, not equality. Why is that so? Because the principle of equity is an ethical principle, is a moral issue. It's not a governmental problem. It's a founding principle of some societies, and it's a major problem today, because when you start thinking of giving to some more than you give to others, you start having a social constraint because that does not answer the principle of equality of what a democracy is and means. 
So consequently, when we really try to understand why the divide, why the increase in the gap, why the social inequalities, and why in some societies we are just seeing that some uh, cannot stay at their homes, they have to go to work because they have no other way, they cannot even work from home. And why do, do they have to do that? If you take out the health professional group, many of them, it's because they can afford to stay at home. So the principle of equity would demand that we give more to this group in this time of crisis. Then we are distributing to others and that those others maybe are not the ones who really need more. So we come here to a very profound principle that Adler could mention in this discourse. Um, how is it that in the human species, what is this wise man doing, the Homo sapiens, when he decides to save a weakest human being from a fire, when there is no reason to apprehend that life in the context of the survival of the best people. So when you look at the, the, the foundation principles of health promotion, uh, discussion must be uh, ignited in the sense that equity is at the foot, at the foundation of how we can grow healthy. You are aware of Antonovsky's proposal that the real mystery today is to understand why some people sometimes suffer less than others and move towards health. I would say that this is Sorry about this. We appear to have lost um, Louis there. Oh, you've come back. Hello, Louis. Okay. Um, Sorry, we lost you for a moment there, but we've got you back. Okay, so um, I hope now I'm back again. So to finalize, I would propose that re the redefinition of the concept behind health means that we should take particular care of what information today means and how healthy is built in our societies in order to be um, favorable for those who are not in the best position to not only receive that information, the information, but also to manage that information in the sense that they can grow. Up. So some of these ideas that I've shared with you, uh, you can find them in a text that we made available. Uh, before this uh, moment. And also, we want to invite you to continue this discussion. Of course, we can now have some questions, but we have prepared a survey where we would like to receive your input, your uh, reflections on how health promotion today can mandate a different perspective on how we are dealing, or a complementary perspective on how we are dealing with the COVID 19 crisis. So, I just took the time to look at this principle of equity. And if we don't take this as a very uh, special foundation of our societies, I wonder if the Homo sapiens will not continue to do his distraction, not only in terms of the environment, but also in terms of who is entitled to survive and who is not entitled to serve. So this change from the homo sapiens to the homo salus might be a possibility to live the future. So thank you very much. Many thanks, Professor Luis. That was really interesting. We've had some questions coming through during your talk. So I'll start off with the first one. You mentioned about utopia. Do you find challenges in health promotion with people who are of the belief that they are happy to die young if they have a good time on the ride? Maybe we could take some questions. Yes, can you hear me, Professor Louis? I, yes, I can. 
Lovely. So thank you very much for that interesting talk. We've had some questions come through. I'll just repeat the first one. You mentioned about a utopia. Do you find challenges in health promotion with those people who are of the belief that they are happy to die young if they have a good time on the ride? That is a very interesting question. Um, you know, we should be free to live as we wish. That is one of the Rabelais proposals when we, when we talk about it. Um, what life is, what is the meaning of life? Of course, um, that perspective, if it is the, the perspective that some wanted to, to use for their lives, uh, health promotion might not be the exact proposal to consider how that life will be lived. But inside of every one of us, there is a movement that calls us to live and to live the better and the longer. And this movement is rooted in the principle of entropy, of chaos. Every one of us, we fight chaos. We want to get out of entropy. But when we are immersed in a society that look at us only as objects to be part of the production of the increment of what that society can give, then we lose the sense of ourselves, lose the sense of what is life for and therefore the consequence can be just what you refer to. so the moment when uh, we shift and society is not any longer based on the financial economic if you want um, increment that we have today as the foundation of these societies that we are living in especially in Europe, maybe we will find less and less people that want to live like that, the long, the shortest, and with the more intensive uh, lifestyle. So the way the society is organized may help increase or decrease that mindset. So I would say that our promotion really can have a direct impact on that kind of social organization. Okay, thank you. Another question has just come through. Much of what you present relates to a salutogenesis approach to health, assets orientated and positivist. So how is such a worldview getting harmed in the current reframing back to a medical model by the response to coronavirus? Thank you. That is a very, very interesting question. I would say that it is almost absent. Uh, of course, we have been organized in the sense that we rely on the medical setting, on the healthcare setting, our problems. And our societies during the last, uh, in Europe, in some countries during the last crisis, our society have been cutting down public expenditure in the health system. And therefore, that is one of the reasons why we come to the situation that we are living today. That has been already very well demonstrated. Now, the question that we should ask is, why is there in North Italy um, a direct um, comprehension or understanding that vitamin E and vitamin D have an impact on the death rates that we find. Why don't we go to Sardinia and we study why the casualties in Sardinia are different from the rest of Italy? Of course, there are people dying also in Sardinia, but not as in the northern part of Italy. So I think that there is 
from the health promotion perspective. And, and you see that uh, recently, finally, the WHO came announcing that maybe the new coronavirus will stay there forever. So how are you going to manage this staying there forever? One possibility will be to invest in health promotion. And by investing in health promotion, create the conditions to increase resilience. And by increasing resilience, increment the capacity of, of individuals to deal and to live with the new kids in the block. But unfortunately, I would say in some countries, and I put my country as an example, we don't see any of this. We, we tell people, can even have sunshine. And we know that sunshine can have a very direct impact in this kind of uh, crisis. Of course, we are so worried with the issue of dying and getting sick that the health promotion initiative has not been able to make its own way as a complement approach to prepare societies, families, old people, seniors, uh, to face this kind of crisis. I would say that today, from the perspective of salutogenesis, so you see, salutogenesis means creation of health. So from the perspective of salutogenesis, we have a set of tools that are today very well established that do create health and help people to increment their resilience to face the, the new coronavirus. So why don't we talk more about that? Why don't we change the way we are organizing our society in the sense that we introduce those salutogenic strategies to, to, to deal with the new kid in the block? I believe that uh, the health promotion community should be much more active and come forward with some proposals to deal with this situation. Thank you, Professor Louise. We've just probably got one more time for a question and some um, positive feedback. It's a really fascinating presentation. Thank you for that. That's somebody who works at Derbyshire Council and he's asking how can we translate the passion and enthusiasm of academics and researchers like yourself into our everyday work in order to make a real difference in our communities? That's that's the mo that's one million dollar question uh, testimony on this. I think we should, you know, academic academic or whatever you want to call it, we should go to the to the front line. We should start if we have not already done that. We should start our interaction with the communities, offer offer our contribution. Uh, that's something I have done. Uh, I have put it that, you see, in, in my context, my cultural context, uh, as, as I think it's also common to many of your cultural contexts. You see, I refuse to use the word social distancing. We should not use this. We should talk about physical distance, but not social distance. That is a tremendous error. And, and, and therefore, from this perspective, if we think salutogenically, you, you can make a, a lot of changes in your surroundings, in your families, settings, etc. Second, in my own context, the health services have been concentrating all resources that are left after the crisis and all the public uh, spending cuts. Everything has been concentrated to help people with the COVID-19. And so, for instance, smoking cessation support is not possible to find anywhere. There are no clinics, no hospitals, no doctors uh, offering this so, so important. Because many people heard now that, well, using tobacco, it's not that uh, favorable to increment resiliency to the new coronavirus. So this could be a, a trigger for me to stop smoking. But where do I go? And so we have, I have contributed to this uh, access problem for support to smoking cessation by creating a portal 
in the web that is tailored and wants to stop smoking. And this portal is based in the principles of health promotion and in a, in a way that you can, from home, you can use this resource. Of course, it might not solve all the problems, but some people might get help from this resource. It took many years to build this. And now when this crisis came in, I, I could see that, well, using this sense of coherence, increment of those that are affected by this pandemic, and while incrementing their sense of coherence, investing in their, the creation of their own health in order to solve the issue of smoking, it can have a, a result. We are talking about 32% of those using this kind of instrument to help them to stop smoking. So a web-assisted tobacco cessation tool is a possibility. I would say that there are so many problems. Why not think salutogenically when we are looking at those different issues and see how how promotion can bring a very real life uh, proposal in order to uh, contribute with the preventive uh, strategies or with the curative approaches that we are today uh, having in our societies. So for me, uh, I think that the, the community, the, the health promotion community should come to the front line with innovation, with proposals, and with a very direct call to a new morale, to a new set of values. And in this new set of values, demand that those who are in charge of these very critical times respect those values of altruism. Thank you, Professor Louise. And just one final and question. Cut down that logic of the survival of the best fit. Lovely. Uh, talking of the web, um, another question finally, just to be squeezed in from YouTube, one of the um, listeners on YouTube or the audience is people still are not adhering and practicing preventative measures of COVID-19. So beside the community sensitized campaigns are going on, how can we convince people to use preventative measures? Of course, you know, one of the reasons why maybe people are lagging behind on the preventive measures is because they don't understand them. So I think that uh, health literacy could be a very uh, specific instrument or tool, as you wish, that could be used. Uh, health literacy is this capacity that people have to apprehend, to judge, to validate, to, to use in their own lives. Let me give the example of my own country. Uh, for, for, for more than, uh, well, two months, we, we heard the health authorities saying, you should not wear a mask. If there is no relevance to use a mask. So don't use a mask. And now, during the last 10 days or so, the, the discourse has changed. And now there is an order that you should use mask everywhere you go when you get out from your house. These, these kind of messages have a consequence on the minds of people. They don't understand why yesterday it was one way and today is another way. So we, we should be more um, sensitive when we are sending a message to the public. And if the public has not the uh, health literacy, we should increment that health literacy in a very simple way. And doing that, not from the negative perspective, you know, not because you need social distance. No, don't talk about social distance. Talk about physical distance. And because nobody is wants to be far away from the others. That is absolutely nonsense. So when you come with a preventive discourse that increases some strange feeling from people. How can you expect that they will accept all the other or many other preventive suggestions that you might want them to follow? We, we need a coherent approach. And there is where I see salutogenesis as an overarching approach for this. You see, with salutogenesis, you first emphasize the capacity, the comprehensibility 
then you emphasize the manageability and then you emphasize the meaningfulness of what is there that people should do. So if you take the comprehensibility and you invest in health literacy, then you have done a quite uh, nice way to touch the hearts of the people. But then how can you suggest uh, preventive measures that people don't have the manageability to, to increment, to put in their lives? So we should be very sensitive on this. And that is where equity comes in because some people don't have the manageability to, to work out those preventive measures. So what are we doing as a society to increment their manageability? So you see, I'm talking about the three dimensions of the sense of coherence, one of the theories of the solution channel is further. So once we have resolved the problem of manageability, people can now manage. Then we need to check out the meaningfulness. What is the meaningfulness of that process, of that suggestion, of that strategy, of that performing meaning there? Or are we going against the rules, the principles, the moral of the human being? So and this is a kind of, you know, three, uh, three poles that when we put them together in a coherent approach, you are creating help. But if you are just sending messages that don't, are not understood by people, and then those messages they don't apply to you because you don't have the capacity to manage. And then finally, you cannot integrate that in the set of values that you have in your own life. It's natural that people will give up. So I, I think that the, the curative approach should, put, should go together with the health promotion approach. And in health promotion, there are so many ways, so wonderful ways to do that. But okay, let's take the salutogenesis perspective and root all this, the root of all this should be these five principles of our promotion where equity was the one that I wanted to share with you. You see, if people don't feel that they have a value, they don't care, maybe they will just let go the preventive measures, who cares? But if we tell them that you have a value, and therefore we are giving you more than you are giving to the other one that already he has something, or at least he can afford to work from home. Then that person will start to see that society is a coherent body that looks and are interested in his, in his own situation. So for me, uh, we have been lacking this component of health promotion uh, in the current crisis of Many thanks, Professor Luis Sabora Nunes, for your time. Great. And now we're going to move on, thank you, um, to the next presentation, which is delivered by Andrew Rogers, who's a lecturer in public health at the University of Manchester and a highly experienced business consultant specialising in public health and partnership. He's over 25 years experience in leadership, management and commissioning of public health and health promotion programmes at local, regional and national levels. So I'm going to hand over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Claire. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I fear that I might cover much of the stuff that actually Professor Louise has just covered, but hopefully I'll come at it from a slightly different angle um, and it might just solidify some of the key messages that he's already made so eloquently. So what I'm going to talk about is the reframing of public health in the UK coronavirus response. And what I actually mean is not really the UK response, it's the specific response that's been led by England and London, um, which we're seeing every day through the mass media in, uh, in, across the United Kingdom. There is a difference between the English-led response and the Welsh response and the Scotland response and the Northern Ireland response. So I'm mainly talking about this, this English-led response, if I'm honest which has been very much talked about as being led by the science. And I've got some key questions about why being led by the science of public health? Why not the art and the science? As Professor Louise has just been pointed out, there's a lot of art within the way that we do public health. 
And why so little reference to the evidence-based models embraced for the last decade for obesity, smoking, etc. And again, as we've just heard, a lot of those evidence-based models being built upon health promotion. And actually, we're not seeing a lot of that in this public health UK corona response so far. So I mentioned my perspective. Um, I'm, I came into all of this um, in 1984, having done a degree in human ecology. And I've worked, as Claire says, for many years in, in many aspects of health promotion, community development, HIV prevention, and then latterly as a programme director for public health. Uh, before stepping all of, out of all of that and doing business consultancy. And I'm currently a PhD researcher, um, researching what works in community development. So that's the perspective I come on all of this from, solidly as, not an academic, but as a practitioner in health promotion and public health with a fair bit of experience along the way. And to be very clear, what I'm asking is, in this current public health response that we're seeing, particularly in the UK response, why is it so much framed around the science of public health? And actually, is it good science um, that, that, that's actually being portrayed here? What on earth has happened to the art and science of preventing disease, prolonging life and promoting health through the organized efforts of society? Again, picking up from where um, Professor Louise ended, whereas the health promotion gone from this whole thing, you know, I'm using a magnifying glass to look at the whole strategy to go health promotion, health promotion, the process of enabling people to take control over the conditions that affect their health. Is that what's being portrayed out through this massive um, approach that's being portrayed through the media day in, day out? Is that about promoting health by enabling, mediating, advocating for people, developing personal skills? creating supportive environments, it doesn't feel that way to me. It feels much more to me, you know, a track back into early, early 1980s when what we saw was um, health education around this sort of stuff. Um, we keep hearing being led by the science, but we also keep hearing we've never seen this before. We are reacting as a, in a public health response to coronavirus in the way that we are, because we need a massive response and we've never had to do anything like this before. I beg to differ. We haven't, I'll accept we haven't seen a coronavirus like this on a pandemic scale like this before, but we have been in a position as countries to having to face something that's new and emergent that we haven't dealt with before. Um, in recent years, we've had, in many countries, we've had Ebola and we've had SARS and we've had other coronaviruses. But even in the United Kingdom, we go back to the 1980s, we'd never seen HIV before, and we mobilized a massive national response. And the iconic images that we get from that, that time are these things around, um, you know, individualistic um, personal responsibility type messages coming out from, um, from London, mainly from the seat of power. Um, and messages around um, AIDS, don't die of ignorance, and lots of iconic images around that. The iceberg image, tombstones on leaflets, and there was an underlying victim blaming within all of this, which was your personal responsibility, make changes to your lifestyle so that you avoid catching HIV and you avoid getting AIDS and putting a toll on society, etc., etc., etc. Um, and it, it was alongside other things that have gone on at the same time in terms of drug prevention as well. Just say no campaign, same sort of messages, same sort of mechanisms for getting the messages out to people, largely using mass media, largely doing things like putting a leaflet through somebody's letterbox. Everybody got the same leaflet with this tombstone on the front. Shock horror tactics, wake up people, change your behavior. Isn't it interesting that we're coming back now 30 years later to exactly the same type of messaging, the same sort of techniques being used. Um, and actually at the time, not everybody was behind all of this. Um, even Margaret Thatcher wasn't very happy with, with the whole tone of the way some of this stuff was going. And there were lots of um, discussions going on in cabinet about is this the right way to do things or not, or not. So even though we look back at this as an iconic thing at the time, there will be a corporate memory of all of this, that it wasn't the perfect thing, even from those people that were, were behind the programme. What's really 
ironic is that at the time that all of this was happening, this massive media-based campaign around HIV prevention, it was totally opposite to the way that people who worked in public health were understanding how we needed to develop health programmes. Um, and as Professor Louise has already talked about, you know, some of the, the major shifts that were already occurring, we hadn't quite got to the understanding around acid-based community development and salicylic in 1986. We were on the way to that journey. But what we did have was the Ottawa Charter, the absolute grounding of all that stuff around ethics and principles and values around what is it that we need to do to promote health. And we knew then, right at the time that we were running these HIV campaigns, that actually what it meant was connecting with people connecting health as a value for people, um, not just telling them what to do to change their behavior, but actually helping people to get a sense over what they needed to do to take control over the conditions that affected their health. Their health. And actually what um, public health organizations were being asked to do was enable people, mediate with them, advocate for change, strengthen community action, develop personal skills, develop health literacy, create supportive environments, reorientate health services, and build healthy public policy. Not a simplistic thing to do, a major strategic thing to try and bring all these things into play and to shift this balance from it being a professional concern about somebody's health to making it a personal concern that actually I would be interested in developing my own health. And what did even that mean? Well, actually it meant about just controlling my life, reaching all my goals in life, um, living life, actually putting life into life. All of these things were what we, we were discussing within health promotion and public health. And we were facing this major issue, which was HIV. But somehow, despite what happened in, in all of this, you know, we had this national campaigning stuff that really wasn't hooked into this sort of um, thought process around health promotion. Instead, what happened when HIV occurred was that at the national level, we went straight back to stuff that had actually come out of um, the aftermath of the world wars. So we had a health education type that was based around health propaganda, coming up with some really sort of snazzy images and, and slogans to try and prompt people to change behavior. Um, and it was based upon this very simplistic um, model of installing, installing knowledge in people's, you know, transferring of knowledge, not really dealing with how people took on board a message, but just simply get a message to people and try and do it in as, as many different ways as possible. So sometimes using humor, sometimes using shock horror techniques and aiming to develop a reflexive behavior in people and communities, often trying to appeal to emotion. Treating people as empty vessels, spoon feeding the information. And again, as thinking back to today, as Professor Louisa just um, said again quite eloquently, you know, um, we put out these messages around face masks and gloves. And it's a simplistic message. We then change the message because we don't, we're not consistent with it. People get very, very confused. So we're not really thinking about how these messages are actually received by different sectors of the population. So we've known all this for a long time. We've known that health education in itself is a limited tool. It relies upon a health educator transmitting information to a target group. And it's often characterized by um, medical practice designing the message, um, considering that the target group is an empty vessel and that people will be logical with that information that somehow we'll all receive that information in the same way and we will act logically with that information. We're even, even hearing in the current programme, people will use their common sense as if everybody has the same interpretations and will act in the same way with this common sense. Totally forgetting that everybody is in their own particular context. I make decisions about my health in the context of my life. Um, and what my other goals are. Um, so I'm not an empty vessel. Um, and often underpinning all of this is a bit of victim blaming as well. You know, um, if you don't change in this way, it's your fault. And again, hence today, within the messaging around the UK um, response to coronavirus, 
we hear things about save the NHS. If you love the NHS, behave and do things in the right way and you can help save the NHS. And if you don't, if the NHS falls over, whose fault is it? It's yours, not mine. Um, so there's, there's underpinning all these messages, some real sense of, of victim blaming. Now, that's been a little bit um, negative reflections on what happened with the whole HIV campaign. Of course, we actually did develop some really good health promotion programs, despite that overlying image of it's about tombstones on leaflets and it's about big TV campaigns, which are about icebergs. Underneath that, there was stimulated a great range of HIV prevention initiatives. And often because we worked directly with communities. So um, this is from um, a gay men's um, initiative where gay men were, were asked about who, what were the images that, um, what were the things that they liked in terms of Im imagery um, and things like Bart Simpson, ironically was, um, was, was one, of, one of the characters. So some of the materials that were developed were around images that worked with that particular target audience. In Greater Manchester, there was a charity called Lifeline that worked with um, the drug using community. And Lifeline worked with a series of cartoonists and people using drugs to work through and understand what the key messages were and how they were heard by the drug using community. And then for drug users to write with a cartoonist, their own magazine, their own, their own comic. And it was very explicit and many people um, wouldn't particularly approve of, of the messages that are in there. But for that particular community, the messages work really well. And Peanut Pete, which is what the comics were based around, this character called Peanut Pete, became very effective about getting a message across to that community. Similarly, in um, a lot of gay men's communities, the same sorts of things were developed with gay men writing their own leaflets, producing their own videos, doing their own peer-to-peer -peer education, getting messages across to people in a way that had a faithfulness with them. So what we saw was not just, I mean, I'm, I'm using here um, a variation of Alan Beatty's map of health promotion. What we saw in effective HIV prevention was a mixture of education for health, not just health education, but actually quite uh, structured and um, well-developed levels of health, health literacy being developed. So when you're working with the community, asking them to pr produce their own education leaflets, it's about raising up their, their understanding and knowledge of the issue in the first place, and then that getting translated into materials for their peers. So developing um, strong education for health alongside legislative changes, alongside bottom-up community health development, and people that, for themselves working through issues about health for themselves. So as Professor Louise said, you know, this whole thing over, people actually exploring what health means to them. All of those things need to happen and needed to happen to get effective HIV prevention strategies developed. Not simply a health propaganda program in the top left-hand corner of that diagram. So we've known this for a long time. We've known what works in public health programs for a long, long time now. We learned from the HIV campaign and we learned that propaganda is not enough. And some of that, that learning um, you know, informs some of the, the models that were developed. So we, we know throughout the 1980s that we've got strong ecological models of public health now. We've got health belief models, stages of change model, social cognitive theory, theory of reasoned action and planned behavior. And they've followed them, the, their way into many health promotion programs. In particular, we've also realized that propaganda failed to work because it was just about broadcast methods. It was a centrally defined method that might go out on different channels, but still seem to work on the basis that you can take a simple message, boil it down into a catchy phrase or whatever, and broadcast one to many. And we know that in the real world, that just doesn't work. Messages are understood by different people in different ways, particularly now in social media. And what happens is, when messages are communicated, they get filtered, they get changed, and they get passed on in different ways. So a communication campaign understands that, and it recognises that once the genie is out of the box, the idea is out of the box, and it goes out, 
it will be communicated in many ways to the many different people because people themselves will be the channel and will pass it on. And I'll give you an example. I regularly on Facebook get copied into like different games, videos, funny things, information things. And I decide personally the ones that I like and who to send them on to. So if we get football things, they'll get sent on to people like Greg because he likes football. If I get um, things about um, music, they'll go mainly to my kids and a few, few other friends. But I self-select the audience that things go to. And in doing so, I then get sent other things as well. So I'm constantly receiving certain framed sets of information, which a number of people think that I would like. When all of that gets put together, I'll get a whole range of different information, largely because it's been created by the communities that I'm engaged with. This all seems to be being missed at the moment by the current repeat of the propaganda approach that we used in, in the 1980s. I don't see much of um, the, the communication strategy that is being currently espoused within the Coronavirus UK approach taking a communicative approach, multi-strand approach, I see it much more of a broadcast one, even down to simply changing the, the key messages from um, stay at home to be alert, whatever that means, and expecting it just to be broadcast. And we all hear those messages in exactly the same way. Um, again, they think about social distancing. Do we all hear social distancing in the same way? I hear it as physical distance, but with social responsibility. Is that what other people hear? I have no idea. So you can't use this broadcast methodology. You've got to think through how you can use a more communica communicative methodology. And we have lots of programs and models already established in how to do this. This is not rocket science. We've had at least 30 years of developing all of these things. And the government uses these approaches already or has done in recent years through its work with the Department of Health, through its work through Public Health England. In particular, we've heard of social marketing, market segmentation, nudge, etc. And specifically, there are these two models that have underpinned a lot of national public health programmes in the UK for the last five or ten years. How many times do we have to, you know, hear about the use of the uh, potassium Clemente model to underpin a strategy? recognizing that when we're trying to change behavior, we, can't, we don't ever go from people not having a behavior to suddenly doing a behavior simply because we've told them to change or having a behavior and then stopping it because we've told them to change. We know that people go through a whole series of stages. And actually between each stage, we have different mechanisms to move them to the next level. So if people are in pre-contemplation around an issue, how to move them to contemplation. And then the a different set of techniques are then brought in to move them from contemplation to preparation, preparation to action, action to maintenance, etc. We know this. We built whole programs around exercise, eating behaviors, stopping smoking, changing alcohol use, etc. We have whole programs built around all of that, alongside another model, which is around motivational segmentation of the population. Um, recognizing that in any pop, you know, across our population, we have we have a percentage of people, roughly a fifth of them, who are health conscious realists, who actually do have that sense of health, um, and do worry about the behaviours and choices that we make day to day. So if sometimes we drink a little bit too much, or we eat um, our diet shifts, or we don't do enough exercise, we then try and balance that out later on. Um, so there are health conscious realists who will probably take on a, a, a message about stay at home, be alert, almost more readily. There are some people also that maybe take a few more risks but are balance compensated, another 17% of, of the population. But still you put those two together as groups that are interested in health messages. These are people hungry waiting for the, ne the next health message to do something about all of that. The vast majority of people do not live in those two motivational segments. Uh, in particular, the 
unconfident fatalists. There are people in, in our society, uh, quite a large number of them, who actually do not have that sense of health at all. I actually feel quite fatalistic about health, that, you know, it's out there, illness is out there, and it's a matter of luck if, if they get ill or, or ill luck. They're uncomf unconfident about whether they can actually make any change. And just because we've got this big horror uh, approach, you know, oh, there's a virus out there and it's going to get me and, and I'm going to get ill, doesn't it help them feel any more confident about being able to avoid all of that? There are hedonistic immortals who don't particularly feel like that, but are much more into just going, going at life at, at full tilt and not really seeing the consequences day to day. Don't think there'll be consequences day to day because actually they're not thinking day to day. Or rather, they are thinking day to day, they're not thinking about long term. So how we take messages as individuals is not uniform. Any one of us will be in one or other of those segments generally, um, or for particular issues, we may stray into another one. But the point is, we don't all hear a broadcast message in the same way and attach it to our motivations around health. So all these messages around uh, the messages that are changing, are we going to die if we get coronavirus? Are we going to be poorly? Are we, is it just a bit like flu? What is two meters away from somebody? Is that when we're stood still, can I run past somebody and break that two meters? Do I use a face mask? Yes or no. Do I use gloves? Yes or no. Is it young people who get this or old people? If I catch it, can I catch it again? Can I get it off the post or not? If, if I just keep washing my hands, is that going to be okay? Do I then still need to use the gloves and the face mask? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's before we had any even changing the big messages like, so stay at home, stay alert. Uh, and now I can drive to exercise. Uh, I can meet with, with more people, but which more people? So all of those are quite confusing messages as they are, but how they're heard by different segments of the population is very different depending upon which segment you're in. Now, it's not just me that's saying this. Public health programmes over the last five years in the UK have been using this to target, segment their messaging and use it through different communication media, actually using social media to contact hedonistic immortals, actually doing partnership with people like Lad Bible, you know, to try and get health literacy in a, in a, in a in the right way to a particularly segmented audience. There are ways and means of doing all of this, of working with each of these segments of the population. But we seem to have forgotten all of that. I'll come back to that in a little while, but what I will say is that despite the fact that we've, we've gone to a health propaganda national approach, this blunderbuss will just give a message out to everybody and forget how they, they receive it, people themselves, have actually done remarkably well in terms of just developing some of their own health promotion anyway. If we think about the five ways to well-being, if you're online, if you're connected to other people through networks and through social media, etc., there are some wonderful examples of people using this opportunity within the lockdown of learning, of connecting with other people, of giving, crowdsourcing, um, PPE equipment, um, funding new food supply chains, being active online, taking notice. So the art stuff that's being developed has been stunning if you're online. And of course, you know, the health divide has made that even more difficult. Uh, sorry, the digital health divide has made that even more difficult for people who are isolated and lonely and can't take part in all this. But there are some good movements out there already. They don't seem to be being, though, connected into the UK public health approach, this thing led by the science that's broadcast every day around five o'clock. Um, and what we're seeing presented each day is a doctor's new, a doctor's view, a nurse's view, and then some charts and a little bit around epidemiology. We're not seeing all these wonderful things about the five ways to well-being. They are being picked up in news broadcasts, but not connected with this public health response. So my question is, where is the health promotion public health response? Where is this much more nuanced approach 
that please tell me it's going on somewhere. Please tell me that we haven't just forgotten the motivational segments. We haven't just forgotten things like the behavior change cycle and that actually there's a, there's a much more nuanced approach to this public health strategy than is being portrayed each day. And I'm reflecting just on the UK because that's the one that I'm, I'm seeing. I, I do look across um, and compare with other countries and it is interesting that criticism is already mounting about the way that the UK is, is doing this approach and that we seem to be out of step with, for example, the World Health Organization approach. And I think it is down to us as academics to try and bring out what is the difference between these approaches and bring them to the fore, which is why I'm particularly pleased to be able to take part in this European Public Health um, event today, because I think we can, we can try to mobilize some of these comparisons. So, I've said what's wrong from my perspective, just as an itinerant practitioner, um, how do we then start to reframe this in a positive way to bring in more of the art and the science? You know, what is the art of public health around a coronavirus? How do we reorientate some of the actions so that we actually start to enable people to take control over their, their own health? And the key is absolutely in what Professor Louis said right at the end of his, of, his, of his session, which was about directly connecting with people, having these debates about what on earth is health all about then? What on earth is life and living all about? This is, we are going to be entering into a new normal. You know, it's going to be a long time, if ever, before this coronavirus goes away and we go back to the way things were. And actually, do we really want to go back to the way things were entirely anyway? Because there was a lot of things wrong with the way that we, uh, we dealt with the health of people and of the planet in any case. We had never reached that point of salutogenesis with most people, where people really had value of their health and knew how to control the conditions that affect their health day to day. So there's something about how we need to move forward now, and, and it has to be about building more of what we already know that works in public health and health promotion and building it into the approach going forward. We have to move this propaganda approach into something which means something a little bit more solid. And how do we do that? Well, one of the ways that we do it is that we we start to get front and centre some of the other things that are already changing and are solid in local communities. We already do have social prescribing networks. We have health trainers, community connectors, call them what you will. These are people that already know their communities and are having to find different ways of working with them. Why are they not profiled? Why do I see a message from an epidemiologist, a doctor, a nurse, but I haven't yet seen a community connector talking about how their work on the ground is changing with people in communities, particularly those that are not digitally connected. We need to do this rapidly. Um, I, I was talking last week to a group of health trainers who now are working from home. They're working remotely with people. And I was asking, you know, how, how's your work changing? And they told me about how their work is changing dramatically not just in terms of how they're connecting to people over the phone and over video and how that's different from doing it face to face, but they also told me about how people are then relating back to the advice that they give them differently. People that had given up smoking or had um, changed their eating pattern and now in lockdown have reverted back. They've gone back around that, that cycle of change. So now the health trainers feel that they're doing even more vital work now working in a different way with them. This seems to have been forgotten and is out of the public consciousness now about the public health report. We have to be in this front and centre again. Recent and existing programmes like the five a day campaign, like Couch to 5K, they are still important. They're still going to be important coming out of all of this. We can't allow the coronavirus response to swamp all the other public health programmes that still need to continue. And there's a danger, of course, that the funding will be, will be switched and we'll forget all of that sort of stuff. We cannot do that. Existing community development, um, some of it's survived and has taken on a new level, and some of it has just broken down because it just can't work in the same way anymore. 
So we need to support the existing community development and stuff that's broken, we need to find new ways of bringing that forward. Because often um, community development is, is working with those people on, on the, the wrong end of the equity scale, and in particular people that are isolated and lonely and building networks between them. That's absolutely vital moving forward. The digital divide is a huge, huge issue. Despite what I've said about some wonderful things around five ways to wellbeing that have, have, have erupted in the, the virtual space, for those people that can't connect to that, what else is happening? What else is happening for those people that can't connect through iPads, phones, computers, etc.? How are we still taking the broader health promotion message to those people? So there's lots of things that we can do. I mean, one of the things that we can do is to develop a new virtual community development approach to engage with social media and virtual platforms. The virtual space and digital media is not a very happy place for health. Um, it, it isn't just a place that um, has got these five ways to well-being flourishing. There's also a lot of dangers um, in that space as well. There has to be a way that we can take what we know in health promotion, community development, and develop it into a new virtual health promotion, virtual community development approach. At Manchester University, we've got um, the, the, the basis of this in um, some um, course units that we're developing at the moment. But it isn't just for us as a university to do this. We've, we've, got, to, we've got to bridge the way that we do community development and health promotion and get it into that virtual space. But more than anything else, if, I, if there's one message in all of this, it's just that we have to insist that the UK approach gets off from this retrospective health propaganda approach and starts to use the existing evidence of what works in health promotion and public health. In particular, using things like uh, market segmentation approaches, what we already know from social marketing and follow the evidence. We know what an effective public health approach is. It's built upon partnerships and it's built upon co-production. It's built upon this blend of health literacy, healthy public policy and community empowerment. Health literacy and healthy public policy alone will never change health in communities to the level that it needs to do in a sustainable way without the involvement directly in it of those communities. One, it's wrong to do that. And two, it's just ineffective. We know through that market segmentation work, different communities hear messages in different ways. And we have to connect with those communities to embed health promotion and public health. Who says this? Not just me, um, not just um, the Masters in Public Health at Manchester. Within the World Health Organization's case for investing in public health, within the King's Fund Improving Public Health series, then local governments, work around return on investment from public health, they all say this simple thing. Effective public health is about blending these approaches together in a coherent approach, which brings top down and bottom up approaches together into one systematic way of doing things. And I'm gonna leave you with, with this slide and then take, take questions or, or two slides. There's something for me in all of this, which is about even if you've got to put out simplistic messages about behaviour change because this is an urgent thing and you've just got to do something. Don't use vague things like be alert. In infection control for a long time, we've taught around simple analogies like breaking the chain of infection. Now, this is not directly related to coronavirus. This is just about general infection, but just simply that, that model, that analogy of breaking the chain can be so useful because when you start to think about it, it doesn't matter if you're breaking the chain by wearing gloves or a mask or the distance, the essential thing is about breaking the chain. Once people understand that analogy about breaking the chain, they can start to deal with the issue of the gloves or the mask or whatever. Instead of using that very, very basic principle and analogy and building different ways of of talking about that, because I mean, this analogy could be used with young people, with old people, it could be used on, on all different elements of the, of the program. If you have a central idea about breaking the chain and you hang everything else off from that, it can be flexible. 
um, it can be very effective. But it means that once people have got the basic idea in their mind, they can then work through the other bits of it. It's about, do I put on a mask or not put on a mask? Do I wear gloves? Do I wash hands and all the rest of it? If you understand the chain of infection, you can understand where those things play their part within the whole analogy. And instead, what's happening is, it seems like we are changing our mind about the messages because we do put out different messages about gloves. Should you be wearing gloves when you go shopping or not? Or should you be washing your hands? Or should you wear a mask or not? And that seems to be changing. People that hear it, that are not um, involved in medicine or science or epidemiology or whatever, are trying to understand how all that fits together without something to hang it on. Using something like a chain of infection um, basic message would allow people to work that through for themselves. None of that is rocket science. It's just standard health promotion and public health um, theory and practice. And unfortunately, I don't see it within the current science-led public health approach in the UK. And of course, that, the problem with that is that it's not really a public health approach. It's a communication strategy that um, is being aligned with a public health approach. So, okay, I'll stop there and take any questions. Claire. Thank you very much. Uh, we've probably got time for a couple of questions as we're running slightly over. Um, just to remember, reminder to people, if they want to ask any questions, to tweet with the hashtag AskPH or email much at manchester.ac.uk or alternatively, you can leave a comment on YouTube. Um, so the first question, um, so what he's asked is, do you think health promotion can learn from the ironic situation that more people are exercising now that they have to stay at home? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we need to, it, it, it goes back to everything I've been saying really, it's that we need to understand how people got to those decisions, what all that was about. Not second guess it, actually ask people. You know, one of the, the, the key things about the Procesco and DiClemente model is it wasn't a theory that that was just dreamt up and then took out. It was it was built up from looking at practice. What Procesco and Di Clemente did was they looked at how people had changed and then tried to find if there was a pattern of how people had changed. Um, and and what, what emerged was this, this cyclical approach. We have to do exactly the same thing with this. We have to learn what the changes were that, that, that happened with people and why, what were the triggers? Was it just, you know, that they had more time to do it? What, what else was it that was going on for people? Don't second guess it. Try and work through with people which groups of people did um, use the opportunity. Were the people that have not used this opportunity at all? And what was going on for them? Get close to people, get close to their understanding. And then we can work, find a way of, of working other programs for the future. Anything else? There's another one here. So you mentioned be alert and whatever that means. Um, as we live in a quite divided country, there seems to be an association between political persuasion and whether you agree that this message is confusing or not. How difficult do you find health promotion messages during a highly politically charged atmosphere? And how can we cut through the political side to get the best messages out there? It's a really tricky one because health promotion is entirely political anyway. Um, the, the whole thing that I've just gone through in terms of the um, health education, which um, had its heyday in the 1980s, was highly political. That way of um, developing messages was, was directly linked to the political viewpoint, which was around person, developing personal responsibility. You know, there's no irony in the fact that it was Margaret Thatcher who talks about there is no such thing as society, only individuals and families. And the way that we did our health education was on the back of all of that. What flourished, the types of health education that flourished in that time reflected that dominant political ideology. Um, so we just have to be really aware of all of that. And we have to be really aware of, of the um, political dimensions to the whole discussion and the framing of the messages at the moment. Um, the be alert thing is a really political message. Underpinning the whole thing is about a shift in the responsibility of that. It, it comes alongside this thing around people must use their common sense. Alongside the be alert message, of course, was, was the other one that came out at the same time, which was around 
download the app. Do your duty. It's your duty to download the app, save the NHS. All of that is political. It's all about who who needs to make all the changes to get, you know, get beyond this pandemic. Thank you. And I'll just do one final question before we move to Scott, if it can maybe be answered quite quickly, as you mentioned the common sensing there. Um, you mentioned common sense, and this fits with the intercultural research, which demonstrates that common sense is a cultural concept based on people's values and belief systems. Yeah. How do we talk about common sense being a cultural concept at the moment without risking a more divisive discourse? Yeah, tricky. Um... But we have to, don't we? You know, we we have to find a way of breaking through, and maybe it is using. I mean, I, I struggle a little bit with that motivational segments thing, um, but there is something in it about we all hear a message in a, in very very different ways. You know, we need to try and work through and present the different ways that these messages are being heard, um, and and not bring it down to oh, it's white van man or whatever that still thinks that they can go out to the pub and, you know, the sneaky lock-ins and, and all of that. There's, there's got to be a way of stripping that out and getting down to the fact that we just, we hear all this in a different way. We make our decisions in different way because of all sorts of different stuff. Um, within community development in, 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 in what we see to the university, group, we talk about lay health beliefs and, and that's part of it. It's about unpicking where does health fit with all the other beliefs that we have and where did they come from thank you very much and thanks for that talk i'm now going to shift us over to dr scott weaver and ask him to share his screen and unmute himself and um scott weaver is a research associate professor in the school of public health at georgia state university he primarily identifies as a prevention scientist and quantitative methodologist and he'll be talking about electronic nicotine delivery systems. And over to you, Scott. Thank you, Greg. Can you all hear me? Yep, we can. Excellent. And can you see my slides? Yeah. There we go. Thank you. Uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, uh, depending on where you are joining from. Um, I'm, for my talk, I am going to present to you uh, research findings um, that speak to the harm reduction potential of electronic nicotine delivery systems, as we tend to call them, but um, others, the consumers tend to call them e-cigarettes, electronic baking products, jewels, and a whole lot of other things. Um, this um, can tell the story from the perspective of the U.S. smoker and from those of you across the Atlantic and particularly the U.K. and uh, the rest of Europe, you'll um, uh, probably notice that the story of the U.S. smokers may be different than the U.K. or European uh, smoker. And I'd be happy to take some questions at the end uh, about that. But first, um, just want to first uh, disclose the funding source. Uh, we don't uh, the funding for much of this research. The primary source is um, from the U.S. National Institutes of Health and the Food and Drug Administration. Um, we don't accept any funding from the tobacco or vaping industry. And I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the wonderful uh, tobacco regulatory science uh, research team at Georgia State University. If I um, lapse and say my findings I found or refer to I really know that I mean it's really it's the work of a uh, great and wonderful uh, team. So just to provide um, some uh, con context. Um, so as we go through several slides filled with lots of charts and graphs and numbers where these data are coming from predominantly, um, our Tobacco uh, Center of Regulatory Science was a large um, um, $19 million grant, US dollar grant that um, uh, over a period of five years that just ended, uh, we've been conducting serial cross-sectional surveys of 6,000 US adults um, per year um, starting in 2014, our last one in, was in the December of 2018. Um, uh, nationally, uh, these are nationally representative uh, online surveys um, using probability sampling from what was GFK, now is Ipsos um, uh, knowledge panel. We also conducted, and um, for some of the slides, you'll see this, uh, a longitudinal cohort study where we followed um, 
um, about 900 smokers uh, from the 2015 survey and recontacted them one year later. And depending on if I have time, uh, I'll show you a slide that it comes from a, uh, a behavioral economics experiment that we conducted uh, through the online survey methodology with 1,200 smokers drawn from our 2017 uh, cross-sectional survey. Um, so with that background, as alluded to in my title, the motivating um, uh, issue that our research really seeks to address um, uh, or often seeks to address is um, what is the population harm reduction and this is the uh, critical, uh, one of the critical questions that um, policymakers around the world and especially in the US are trying to address when faced with this um, really a relatively still new um, and evolving um, uh, tobacco uh, group of tobacco products. And it's very, uh, it's a nuanced discussion, as you probably well know. Um, I'm going to uh, summarize it here as you have on the harm reducing side is some pillars that you'd want to see is that they are less harmful than smoking. And I just, um, this research that I'm going to present doesn't address how harmful e-cigarettes are. There is some debate, but I, I think it's fair to uh, assume for this presentation. Um, that uh, an alignment with the Royal uh, College of Physicians and the Public Health England and the uh, U.S. National Academy of Science and Medicine is that um, the, the, the continuing uh, consensus is that um, uh, ends are less harmful than smoking, but not harmless. And the big and important question, of course, is um, how much less harmful are they than smoking? Um, um, but um, they also have to be not just less harmful for to have harm uh, to be harm reducing at the population level. They have to appeal to and be used by smokers, um, and critically, who completely switch to them. And I also want to put in little parentheses here um, that those who wouldn't have otherwise quit without ends because they are not harmless. If uh, obviously the idea behind harm reduction for ends would be um, that it's these are the smokers that are otherwise having a hard time giving up nicotine altogether. And, and they could realize some harm reduction potential um, if they were to switch to a reduced harm product. Uh, on the other side, though, there is, of course, concerns about ends increasing population harm. Um, uh, one uh, is that prevalent regular use among youth and non-smokers, uh, particularly those who wouldn't otherwise have smoked or used tobacco, um, that they are, if they're not effective for smokers to quit, or, or they deter, or even worse, they deter or delay quitting. Um, and then there's, of course, a question about sustained or long-term dual use. Is that as bad as just smoking, or is it, um, as some research might suggest, is, are there potentially uh, synergistic effects and increased harm uh, from using both as opposed to just continuing to smoke? Um, so to start off and address one of the key questions um, is, really asking who is using ENDS? So this uh, slide shows results from surveys 2015 through 2018 where, where our measurements stayed relatively consistent. Um, for adults, uh, over this time, you see there isn't really a lot of uh, change among those who are using cigarettes, the red bars, um, uh, you know, some ups and downs, um, but, and, and um, while there's been a sort of a slow trending to increase with the exception of ends use, um, with the exception of 2016 where there was a dip, um, uh, it, it, this increase has not um, been all that great. And in contrast to um, US youth, um, we have seen um, in the US, and this comes from that our research, but the, you know, one of the gold standard surveys in the US conducted by the federal government, um, is that high school youth has really skyrocketed, um, especially you know from 2013 to 2015, and then after a two-year dip, it, it just it, it just um, uh, escalated very quickly from there. Um, and we're also seeing um, quite a bit of increases at the middle school level. So uh, uh, quite contrast to what we're seeing with adults. Um, and I, I'll just note, I'll be remiss if I don't didn't note that the U.S. smoking and acknowledge that U.S. youth smoking has declined over these years. Um, some people have um, uh, been inclined to attribute that um, to the uh, electronic cigarettes and when they're 
engaged in the harm reduction debate. Um, um, but I, I think if you look at the trend line, it, it's questionable um, how much is actually attributable to electronic cigarettes versus some um, uh, a trend that's been ongoing well before electronic cigarettes entered the market. And um, just to note, during this, around the time that electronic cigarettes entered the market, we've had a you know an increase in uh, mass media and education campaign expenditures and efforts. Um, cigarette taxes have been slowly increasing, and we've also seen a declining normalization of smoking. Um, whoops, I apologize. I'm not flipping through my slides. Um, and the uh, looking at vaping among U.S. adult current smokers, um, you can see here that I mean this is a key population for harm reduction and um, with, for ends. And you see um, our surveys have not found any uh, appreciable other than 2016 any appreciable differences or changes over time. We have a pretty consistent, you know, upper 20% range of current uh, smokers who currently use these cigarettes. Um, um, there has been from the very 2015, uh, somewhat of an increase in uh, smokers who are uh, former ENDS users. So um, what we might call, they might be rejecting, trying and rejecting ENDS. And then of course, we got, or it's kind of stuck around 40% of smokers who don't use um, electronic, have never used electronic delivery systems. Let's look at it from a different angle and let's look at, uh, in contrast, uh, what is the smoking status of those who say they are currently using uh, adult um, uh, vaping products. And um, here we do see a bit of a change. Um, um, the proportion that our current smokers is declined from just under 60% to about 40%. Um, uh, on the flip side, we see that uh, um, the proportion of our former smokers has recently increased and that might be a good sign that uh, smokers are switching um, and, and quitting combustible tobacco with the help of e-cigarettes. Um, but concerningly, we are seeing an uh, increasing proportion of um, uh, ENDS users that are, have never smoked a cigarette. Uh, in addition to looking at smoking status, we've also looked at ENDS use among those with mental illness or serious psychological distress, um, which is a uh, the tobacco health disparity population with high smoking rates. Um, here we see uh, uh, that those with serious psychological uh, distress are more likely to be ever in current uh, e-cigarette users. This includes current smokers as well as never smokers. Um, and particularly we see an increase in um, those with serious psychological distress um, who are uh, uh, former smokers using N. So again, that might be a sign of um, um, harm reduction occurring uh, with them switching from currently smoking. Um, um, but we need more research to know for sure. And I'll just highlight a couple other uh, subpopulation uh, findings. Um, so looking at current ends use by uh, poverty level in smoking status, as well as on the right, uh, sexual minority in smoking status. Um, we do find um, that it's important, uh, although we often look at ends use by smoking cigarette smoking status that um, there are actually other combustible tobacco products and you can get um, actually somewhat misleading findings if you don't consider the reality of multi and poly use of tobacco and especially other combustible tobacco products. So we do see a difference here on the left in, um, in the proportion that use ends uh, for those who are current non-cigarette combustible users uh, with those below poverty much more likely to use ends otherwise. We don't see that for current cigarette smokers. Um, and somewhat of a same uh, conclusion for those of sexual minority uh, identification. So just to recap this section of the presentation, uh, who is using them? We do see that, we do know that adults are using them and increasing so, especially adult smokers, but the trends are increasing among former smokers, which is a, probably a good thing um, uh, for harm reduction. Um, but also among never smokers, which is uh, almost certainly not a good thing. Um, it'll, I'll come back to this later, but uh, note um, that 40% of smokers have not tried ends, despite um, you know the uh, some of the messaging and marketing around their potential to be um, help them quit smoking. Um, and 31% have tried ends but have discontinued. Um, Concerningly, youth are using them to a much greater extent, and the trend is is is, is quite horrible. Uh, to put it frankly, 
Uh, we see increases in daily ends use as well. I didn't show that uh, data, um, but daily regular ends use um, and use smoking is um, decreasing, but there's a question, as I've alluded, um, of how much, if any, is attributable to ends use increases. And we find um, that uh, certain select population, uh, tobacco disparity populations, such as um, those with severe psychological distress, sexual minorities, uh, low SES populations, among others, are more likely to use ends, but mostly among those who are smoking combustible tobacco. So that's, you know, I would argue a good thing. Um, but there still remains the question, will ends increase or decrease tobacco-related health disparities in these populations? So, and that gets to um, another pillar of that um, balance and the harm reduction discussion um, is to what extent are smokers who are using ends, are they quitting smoking? And just to start this section off, um, I want to um, just um, remind people that um, most smokers, and here we show about 80% of current smokers report higher, very high discontent due to their inability to quit, the perceived addiction, and regret about having ever started smoking. And that's aligned with about 75 plus percent that we, we find internationally and within the US that uh, really wish they never started and would like to quit smoking. Um, so in our, our longitudinal cohort study that I had mentioned at the beginning, um, we, find, we um, took um, dual smokers and ENDS users um, in the beginning at baseline and then and followed them up one year later to assess um, their vaping and smoking status. And here we find that um, the vast majority, 89%, um, were still smoking one year later, um, split about um, about half and half um, between continuing to dual use both products um, or having gone back to continued smoking but quitting electronic cigarettes. Uh, only 11% had quit smoking and uh, a small 7% um, had quit all uh, both products. And this slide shows um, adjusted odds ratios um, when we're, where we compare those who had used electronics, those smokers who had used electronic cigarettes um, versus um, the reference group here is those who had not used electronic cigarettes over this one year period. And uh, we found that those who are using electronic cigarettes, um, which replicates many U.S. cohort studies, um, uh, were had lower odds of being smoke free 12 months later. Um, and we adjusted for a number of factors, social demographic factors or quit history intentions or smoking intensity and several other potential confounds. Um, we didn't find any um, uh, differences depending on whether they used um, daily or non-daily, uh, whether they were using ends, self-reported ends for, um, uh, for quitting smoking or not. And, and even, and we did find that some non statistically significant differences in what type of e cigarette product they use. But again, none of this would suggest that um, in, um, in our population at this period of time, we're, um, uh, we're in, under real world use conditions, we're helping smokers quit at a population level. Um, so, given that, what are the factors that are affecting smokers' use or non use of ends and their smoking outcomes? So we've asked them, and this actually, this question is borrowed from the UK's ASH survey, um, uh, their 2016 survey, and we asked them, what are the reason, uh, those who have not, smokers who have not tried uh, electronic vapor products, we asked them, which of the following are the reasons you have not tried, and should, the 2017, these are actually a pool of 2017 and 18 data, so they're a bit more recent. Um, and we find that um, the predominant reasons for not having tried, um, and they're able to select um, a number of options for this question, um, is um, they don't want to substitute addiction for another. They were concerned about that they were not safe enough, and they don't think they could uh, help them quit. And related to perceived safety, safety uh, and maybe concerns about addiction, we also have assessed over multiple years um, uh, their perceptions of harm of e-cigarettes compared to or relative to smoking cigarettes. And we find that over time, um, and this is to a greater extent than uh, I know UK's track is somewhat similar trend, but of course starting at much more levels, um, that there's a rapidly increasing and substantial proportion of US adults, including current smokers, 
who are misinformed of the relative risk of ends, perceiving them to be equally or more harmful than cigarettes. And we had a, a lot of, as you probably know from the news over the last year, um, uh, a lot of negative publicity around e-cigarettes related to elect, uh, electronic vaping product, uh, lung, uh, injury, related injury, and, um, um, and I expect that this has increased, but I don't have newer data yet. So in our other research, we have shown a um, relatively strong association between the perceptions of risk of using these cigarettes um, and uh, being lower odds of um, using cigarettes. Um, so risk perceptions do seem to be important in, um, uh, convey, uh, in, in, in the, uh, smokers' decisions to use um, e-cigarettes. Um, a little bit of a tangent, but I guess tied somewhat in terms of health uh, communication to the last presentation, um, is um, when we think about these misperceptions and uh, uh, that might be deter deterring smokers from using ends or affecting the patterns of use, um, uh, we, we, with that in mind, we looked at who do smokers trust for as health sources? And we do find that um, although there are high levels of misperceptions and uncertainty about the health effects and public trust in health experts and FDA is positive and greater than the media or tobacco vapor industry, which is, I would say, overall reassuring, might be even surprising and for some people, especially in the media and government. Um, and then we do find in separate research that whom adults trust is quite important. Um, greater trust towards the or less distrust towards the tobacco and vapor industry is linked to perceptions of lower risk of daily use, but also greater uncertainty about those risks and greater odds of using. And that misperceptions that ends are equally or more harmful than cigarettes is a, it's a associated with lower likelihood that they would be currently using ends and fewer number of days, if they are using, um, the fewer number of days that they've used in the past month. Um, we've also I looked at research looking at specifically at the perception of perceived risk of fire or explosion related injury from ends. These are represent a really rel very small, a re relatively rare occurrence of ends use, but um, they um, uh, are very graphic and, and those who study risk perceptions and risk communications can imagine that they have probably an outsized effect on perceptions. And we do find that half of smokers perceive risk as medium to high. Um, 11 to 24 percent, uh, 11 to 37 percent were actually uh, uncertain about the risk, and this these um this perceived specific perceived risk is more likely to lead to people that more likely uh, smokers are more likely to believe ends are equally or more harmful than smoking, less likely to believe that the positive aspects of the end use outweigh the negatives, and less likely to be current end users. We also asked um then what are the main reasons that um. And they stopped using electronic vapor products. And uh, while concerns about safety, uh, and this one we only uh, they could only pick one main reason. Um, concerns about safety um, um, was up there as a concern, um, but really um, we see um, that um, really uh, the reason that smokers who tried but ultimately rejected them is because they uh, predominantly didn't feel like smoking a cigarette. Um, and didn't help them craving. And then of course, there's the curiosity factor that was some reason that um, some had decided. And so we've dug deeper into this um, and we even dug deeper until we asked that, that one question earlier back. Um, we find back in 2014, smokers um, rejected ends were over more, uh, more likely to report that ends are less enjoyable than cigarettes. And this held across different patterns of use and um, who uses it. it was only those who had actually switched um, and not surprisingly, those who had switched from smoking to e-cigarettes completely said that e-cigarettes were more enjoyable. And here, um, in considering whether to vape smoker, uh, smokers consider not only the potential risk, but they also weigh the potential benefits. And they have to weigh these two together in their decisions on whether to try or uh, not try uh, vaping products. And, um, and we find that current smokers do reject e-cigarettes were more likely to say that the negatives outweigh the positives. So just to quickly recap, um, within the context of the 2015 to 2016 U.S. regulatory and tobacco vaping market landscape and real world use, um, there's no evidence that we found of ends helping smokers quit at rates that were higher than smokers 
who are not using the products. Um, some proximal factors that we've identified that affect smokers' use of any of, of e-cigarettes is their harm uh, perceptions. Um, and related to that is trust of the message source on end health effects. Um, we find also importantly general dissatisfaction and lack of enjoyability of using e-cigarettes relative to smoking cigarettes, which I could unpack in soon A. I'm gonna move through some of these final slides relatively quickly, quickly but I'm almost done. Um, um, but as I prefaced the last uh, the recap, the, a lot of our research, the, the evolving marketplace makes it very difficult to, uh, for the research to keep up, if it's ever possible to keep up with the uh, products that are on the market. And we have now what we call fourth generation products. Uh, they typically are smaller, discrete, um, more technologically advanced, um, uh, and um, use, uh, have higher nicotine uh, delivery um, using the team salt based formulation. Um, and this has been, and Juul is the, one of the initial products in this category, and they've got a lot of the, uh, they're found internationally, although they're pulling out of some of the international markets, but they've got a lot of negative attention because they've been uh, blamed for the beginning of the youth vaping epidemic in the U.S. and lately um, perhaps Canada. Um, colleagues have looked at their marketing strategy being behind that. Um, Youth-oriented advertising initially, um, um, of course, it, it doesn't help or it does help maybe for smokers, but maybe not keeping youth from using uh, and, uh, is that the nicotine delivery is higher than the earlier generation of cigarettes um, using free-based nicotine. And we've looked at um, who's using uh, dual use among U.S. adults um, to see if it's, you know, of course, we've talked, we see that youth are using them. Uh, the product, and that's a great concern, but are adults using them? And we do find that they are, interestingly, that, uh, and that's, I mean, not surprisingly, that, that it's predominantly younger adults. Um, and um, race ethnicity, we find some interesting findings, whereas there's really not much race, racial ethnic differences in the U.S. among, uh, among ends current use. But when we look at Juul, African Americans are, uh, as well as Hispanics, are more likely than white non Hispanics to use Juul. And that might be related to using it with cannabis and so not unintended use. And we do find though that current smokers are more likely to use Juul as are, um, they are to use other ends. Looking at reasons for using ends, um, we do find in terms of compared to the earlier products, you know, smokers complained about them not being like smoking. We find that um, uh, a lot of, that there is a higher percentage of smokers. Uh, smokers are who are dual users are more likely to say it feels like smoking a regular cigarette than smokers who use um, uh, other e-cigarette products excluding dual. And also, but very, very popular uh, uh, in a, uh, is that the flavors that dual comes in. They, uh, this is across the board, not just for dual, it's for e-cigarettes as well, but um, it is cited as a main reason for choosing the brand that they choose, which uh, has been of the flavors has been an important question um, that policymakers are struggling with because on the one hand you have smokers and, and, and maybe having giving them the option of a non-tobacco menthol flavors might help them be more successful at using e-cigarettes to quit. At the same time, we know flavors are very appealing to kids. Um, Juul has, because of pressure and regulatory um, action more recently in the U.S., has uh, removed um, flavored almost all of the flavored the flavored options from the market, except for mint and menthol. Actually, they took menthol, mint off, I'm sorry, um, later. And, um, um, and I think I'm running out of time just saying we have some evidence um, uh, that e-cigarette um, smokers, they may initially start, initiate e-cigarettes um, with tobacco flavored e-cigarettes, but um, if they're cont continue to use, um, they are more likely to be using other flavors other than tobacco. And in more recent research we published, we do find that um, those who users of tobacco and men menthol flavored e-cigarettes are less likely to quit smoking and are more likely to be a dual user. Um, um, and we've done, and just to to that behavioral economics experiment that I mentioned in the beginning, we have found that uh, in an experimental paradigm that smokers who prefer electronic vaping products um, prefer them because they're um, prefer them if they're less harmful than cigarettes, again, uh, a no-brainer, um, but that they're effective in helping smokers quit, they're lower priced, and that they're not menthol flavored. Um, that was for those who are non-menthol smokers specifically. Um, 
and then uh, the you know our team is currently doing research um, uh, and tracking uh, the new tobacco product in the market. This is a heated tobacco product. UK has um, some products. We have currently one primary product in the market, only one that's authorized for mar- to be marketed in the US, and that's ICOS. Um, and um, and we're tracking that. It launched in my home city of Atlanta. And stay tuned for those results in the next year or so. So just to recap, um, there's potential for newer ends and heat tobacco products to better help smokers quit with better nicotine delivery and maybe a more comparable experience of smoking. Um, and non-tobacco flavors might be important in this. Um, but there are some very major challenges. Um, uh, adoption among smokers t- whom, whom tend to be lower income it might be impeded by higher initial costs and increasing taxes of e-cigarettes uh, in different in various jurisdictions. Um, the appeal of youth, which is leading to regulatory action, is um, also going to be a, a major challenge. Perceptions of harm, and of course, we're trying to track right now what COVID-19 is doing to smokers um, in their smoking, but also their use of um, these reduced harm, potentially reduced harm products. And the big question is, will these newer products overcome the negative publicity, regulatory, and policy actions in smokers' perceptions of and experiences with earlier generation products? I don't have an answer to that question. Uh, maybe the better question is, how could these newer products overcome these um, barriers? So with that being said, thank you. I'd be happy to take questions if there's time. Many thanks, Dr. Scott Weaver. We have had some questions coming in and you've just managed to answer a couple of those with the the latter part of your talk around menthol cigarettes was one of them. So another question is, studies have shown that people mistakenly believe that nicotine-free cigarettes are safe, are safe to smoke and in some circumstances result in people smoking more. So do you find that this is similar with ENDS? So although there's reduced harm, the quantity of consumption increases. Um, yeah, yeah, yes. Um, the, uh, we haven't, we, we do have, I'm trying to go back. Uh, we have we've published many studies and one study we did look at more, not less, not perception so much, but whether they perceive um, uh, what they're like an e-cigarette to have nicotine or not have nicotine or whether they consumed or nicotine. Uh, we know that with youth, there, there has been up until recently um, a great perception that e-cigarettes didn't contain nicotine. With adult smokers, they generally know that it contains nicotine. I, uh, I mean, they, if they were using an e-cigarette product that doesn't contain nicotine, um, uh, they, they would know it because they would be having strong cravings and withdrawal effects. Um, um, so I can't really speak to whether perceptions of nicotine-free e-cigarette products among uh, adults uh, is leading to changes in quantity. I don't I would think that misperceptions would have the same pattern as you described, but um, we don't. We haven't collected data or looked at that. Okay, thank you. Another question: You looked at who smokers trust for their information. Have you investigated the levels of trust against the person's socio socioeconomic status? I think you did talk a little bit about this. If so, what does this say about how information might need to be tailored to different groups? Right. Yes, and. and uh, uh, if you caught the citation, the details are there, and I'll try to best to remember those findings. Uh, there, there are lots of uh, data that we presented in that paper, and, and we did uh, include um, uh, uh, education level and income um, as social economic factors and predictors there. And we do find that those of, uh, who are low social economic status um, and those who are low income, they are more likely, they're more likely to be smokers, as we know, and, and tobacco users in general, they're more likely to they're, they're, they're less likely to trust um, um, uh, government, um, especially the Food and Drug Administration, and, and, um, and I think public health professionals, but, um, but still the average trust is still high, um, but less likely than the higher SES individuals. Um, but they were more likely to trust or had less distrust of, of um, vaping tobacco companies. Okay, thank you. And just finally, if we can fit one more in, there've been reports of ends exploding, including in people's mouths. Do you find that when um, that these create headlines, people switch back to cigarettes? Um, we, we have anecdotal. We have evidence that they might be. Uh, our survey was cross-sectional, and we didn't do. A, we haven't conducted an experiment where we actually. Um, it could be arguably unethically or difficult to do so. That where we show them advertisements of ends uh, exploding uh, and, and then see what, how, the, what, 
how that changes their behavior because it could actually push them in a harm increasing direction. Um, but um, based on our our finding we, findings that uh, the um, and we haven't actually asked them specifically, uh, I should say, about exposure to those products. But I do know other uh, other folks who have and um, and exposure to um, media presentations and, and public health discussions of, um, of um, public health officials, medical officials discussing uh, um, uh, the explosion uh, of e-cigarettes has um, is associated with perce perceiving them to be more risky and that's associated with them being less likely to use. So I would not be surprised if that is, and, and, and a little in our focus groups, we do hear smokers telling us um, that's the reason that they have quit using e-cigarettes. So um, again, I don't have empirical data to support that directly, but um, we have a lot of um, uh, data that suggests it. Great, thank you. Um, thank you to Dr. Scott Weaver well, for your time and your expertise today. We're moving on now to Dr. Yannette Thomas. So we just change the slides around. And Dr. Sure. Yannette Thomas is a globally acknowledged thought leader, urban health champion, and an advocate for valuing the health of women and girls as an economic imperative. She founded the Bajorna International and Strategic Transitions to influence the progress, health, and well being of individuals and communities across the world. She's a founding board member of the Women's Economic Imperative, and she leads the organization's focus on the economic valuation of the health of women and girls. She's also um, a global advisor for the Center for Urban Health and Development within the Asian Institute of Poverty Alleviation. She extends her focus on the global south and the realization of the sustainable development goals in this last decade. And finally, she's the associate editor for Women and Girls for Cities and Health. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Yannette Thomas. And we'll just get the slides ready and ready to unmute. Okay. Am I okay? Am I yes, unmuted? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. And let me know if you can hear me well enough because I've turned my volume down so that I won't appear to be shouting. Um, well, I want to thank you, uh, Claire and Greg and your colleagues um, for inviting me to be part of this important webinar. Whether in the urban sector or rural sector, women and girls bear a disproportionate burden of global health inequities. Social upheavals and nat natural disasters and public health emergencies such as, as disease epidemics exacerbate and amplify these health inequities. COVID-19 bears this flag. So today I would like to uh, take this opportunity to briefly focus in on this, especially in this the last decade of realizing the SDG goals and as we process through the current pandemic. So the landscape, the SDG framework um, as we're, most of us are, are we're well aware of, the sustainable development goals with the 2030 agenda, um, this framework presents a broad approach with a strong focus on, on equity and leaving no one behind. All of the goals impact the lives of women and girls, but four zero in specifically. Goal three on good health and well being, goal five focusing specifically on gender equity, goal eight decent work and economic growth, goal, goal 10 reducing inequalities. These serve as action points for focusing on the health of women and girls as an economic value um, for the robust development of communities and, and municipalities and cities. It's interesting that um, now um, I'm a medical sociologist, social epidemiologist, and in this time, we are forced to collaborate, um, work as science teams with economists, and planners um, and everyone else to think critically of how health impacts our future and our development. So when we think of valuing the health of women and girls, 
increasing the investment in the health of women and girls produces stable and productive communities. It's cost efficient. Um, and as we well know, um, in, in many countries, every dollar spent on family planning saves at least $4 that would have been spent treating complications arising from things such as unplanned pregnancies and other, other um, concomitant um, issues. So COVID-19 has brought this flag and brought us squarely to be thinking of the existing in inequities. So experience from other shocks such as Ebola, HIV AIDS, um, SARS, um, you know, MERS, show us and have exemplified this deepening of pre-existing inequalities. And they also amplify the vulnerabilities in, in health, social, political, and economic systems. So the UN report, UN just uh, uh, released a report back in, in April um, on the impact of COVID-19 on women and girls. And according to the United Nations, the world's formal economies and the maintenance of daily life are built on invisible and unpaid labor of women and girls. Where does this occur? Women care for ch women and girls care care children and families, older family members, ill family members. They're involved in the informal sectors, um, service industries, and so women are doing three times as much unpaid care work as men. And data shows that women predominate in the informal sector and in the service sector, which has been dramatically impacted by the current pandemic. If we take for the US, for example, women hold 78% of all hospital jobs, 51% of pharmacy jobs, 51% of, of grocery store roles, um, bringing them to the front line. They comprise 70% of the global health workforce. And unfortunately, I must note that they earn roughly 33% less than men. But focusing on the health and the current issue as frontline responders, um, women are, are health professionals um, representing, as I said, 70% of the global workforce. Um, they're care, in addition to doing that, being out, they're also caregivers in homes and families. So when they go home from work, they are, are at the front line. And if, if family members are ill, um, um, if, if they're elderly, or even going out into the care sector, not for family members, but working as caregivers in home situations. Women are more likely to be community volunteers. Um, so women are making crit crit critical contributions to address the outbreak every day and to mitigate the impact. So we, we're seeing um, and this is a, a natural experiment evolving as, as we see data being collected. Women are bearing a disproportionate share of the adverse health, social, and economic impacts. So how does this look? Um, if you think about it, in spite of their participation, women are 25% more likely than men to live in poverty. That means they lack resources to provide for their and their children's health. This graphic um, from the United Nations um, visibly shows um, this, this impact. So, and, and in addition to that, they are more exposed because they're frontline. So if we look at the case of uh, uh, two European countries, Spain, we see that female healthcare workers or, or greatly compared to men, were, were much more um, infected because they're much more on the front line. Um, the same as the case of Italy. And this is in the formal healthcare sector. It doesn't reflect the informal. So women, to recap, women bear primary and secondary impacts. And this leads to, I, I, I highlight two particular um, um, issues of access to care and poverty. So what do we do? What hope do we have for mitigating these impacts? 
public health preparedness and response should consider both the direct and indirect health impacts on women. And the United Nations recommends that there should be adequate representation of women um, in response and recovery planning and implementation, not just, uh, not just focusing on the outcomes at the beginning and at the end of the equation. Um, uh, uh, an earlier presentation focuses, uh, focused on uh, public health messaging. Such messaging should target women and girls specifically and not globally and not just men in particular. Um, we should also address the specific needs of women as frontline workers, particularly health and psychosocial and work environment issues. Uh, we should provide resources and standard health services for women at all stages of the life course. So girls, women, uh, elderly women um, uh, is, is of primary importance. So in this last decade and with the experience of COVID-19, we must work to achieve goal three, the good health and well-being, um, goal five, gender equity, a goal eight, decent work and economic growth, goal 10, reducing inequalities, but recognize that each goal impacts our response to COVID-19. And I, this, 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 this graphic from the United Nations um, very nicely shows how these, each of the goals, the SDG goals um, are impacted by in this instance, COVID-19 pandemic, but we know that we have coming um, and, and emergent um, uh, uh, pandemics and health emergencies and health inequities that plague the lives of women and girls. So this call to action really focuses in on addressing these gender inequities and we must address them. And if we do, we can realize this triple gender, triple gender dividend that would benefit everyone. Addressing the gender inequities that exist in health will yield to health for all. It would bring quality and accessibility to health to more people. In terms of gender, recognizing and rewarding and facilitating the integral role of, role of women in the care economy as health professionals and unpaid care provided by women and girls in households and the underpaid services provided by women in the informal sectors. In terms of the economics, it would bring more jobs and increase productivity. Um, and increased productivity makes communities more viable. They're more economically um, um, effective and and, and healthier. So it's important that we see the health of women and girls as critical to the health and economic viability of communities, municipalities, and cities. So with that, I wanna thank you. And this was an intent to focus in on, on, on these salient issues and to raise awareness and to encourage as we think of research and um, not just for the sake of gender equity, but looking at this from the whole perspective of the life course, girls to women and women and their disproportionate role of providing care in both the formal and informal sectors and making sure that we are responsive to the health needs and the economic needs. Um, because as, I, as, as we all know, and as we've learned from historically, once women are healthy, the family is healthy and the community is healthy. So um, this was a call of attention to this issue of gender equity and health in the current pandemic and calling us to be aware that as we focus in on coming emergencies, thinking of a whole population approach and specifically zeroing in on the health of women and girls. Thank you. Thank you very much for that talk and uh, for ending um, the European Public Health Week on that note. We do have a few questions for you um, before we do come to a complete end. Um, so 
We have heard a lot about people appreciating the health workforce at the moment and demands for them to be better looked after when the pandemic is over. As you mentioned, 70% of the global health workforce are women. Do you feel this appreciation could spread into other industries post-COVID? So I'm, I'm focused on, I'm a, a medical sociologist, social epidemiologist, so obviously I focus on the health, but definitely, and that's why I said if women are healthy and using, and, and men too, but I'm, I'm focusing on women at this point, if women and girls are healthy, the, the, the community is healthy um, and the population is healthy. So we know that um, in terms of entrepreneurship and business, we rely on a healthy workforce. And so definitely it impacts our ability to produce cars or ability to work in, um, um, you know, um, work on farms or produce, be economically viable. So every aspect of the workforce has implications for the health of, of communities and societies. Thank you very much. Um, you also mentioned providing resources at all stages of the life course. Um, do you notice differences for women that are different from general differences across the life course? And if so, can you explain what those differences may be? So life course in terms of um, development um, would be for women and girls, girls and women would be different from for boys. So life course in terms women are the reproductive um, arm of, of, of human beings. So women and girls have issues related to um, um, uh, fertility development, reproductive development, um, access to sanitary, um, uh, sanitary and appropriate care. Um, women bear children, so maternal, maternal and child health issues. Girls, girls become women. Girls um, need to have clean water access, good sanitation in order to um, take care of their, their reproductive cells. Um, and because women are the fulcrum of the family in terms of care, um, um, bearing children, largely providing for the care of children, um, and for ensuring that the home um, is 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 equitable, um, no law as women are 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 professional women are in the workforce, but nonetheless women are still seen as the 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 the, the bearers of care. Um, we have had um, progress where there's equity in terms of men and women in homes. But generally and globally, especially in the global south, even in the global north, um, it still falls back on women. So um, in terms of reproductive health, in terms of um, change in over the life course, um, stress and development, it impacts not just the woman, it impacts children and the family. In terms of care of our, our elderly, um, uh, elderly um, parents and 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 relatives. And as women age, women go into post-reproductive life, the, the um, needs vary in terms of their health care. So the impact not just on, on infectious um, diseases, but in chronic disease um, care. Thank you. And we have one last final question. Um, you mentioned the importance of involving girls and women in health preparedness planning. And what do you see are the key enablers to this? Well, what we are seeing um, from research and looking at um, um, policies and programs is planning focuses on men more than on women. And planning needs to recognize and take engage women early on because women have the responsibility of ensuring that the family is secure, um, that the children are secure, that the older members of the family are secure. So women can say to policymakers and planners, both at the municipal and at national and subnational levels, these are the needs of the family. 
These are the things that we need to have in order for us to be safe. Um, women in transition economies, women in, in migration, forced migration scenarios, bear the unequal burden of caring for children and everyone else. So they can give us insights into what are the needs of the family in a crisis situation. So women must be part of the, the early part of the equation um, and not just um, being provided solutions. Thank you very much for that. And I'd also like to thank you for giving your presentation and thank the other speakers, Louis, Andrew, Tina and uh, Scott. Oh, sorry, Scott's just disappeared off my screen. I would just like to now pass it over to Professor Alpana Verma um, to close the European Public Health Week. And um, she's the, for those who didn't see her yesterday, she's the head of the Division of Population Health, Health Services Research and Primary Care at the University of Manchester. Thank you, Craig, um, and hope all of our listeners have had a fabulous week of events. Um, all that's really left for me to do is to really point our listeners to um, some resources that are available. If you're interested in finding out more, um, we are part of the European Public Health Association and um, we uh, are very keen to hear from you. Uh, there are several sections that um, our Public Health Week has covered. Uh, Greg and I, together with a lot of the team here, are part of the urban health section. And uh, we started off um, at the beginning of this decade uh, with 10 members. And I think now, um, Greg, there's over a thousand members, I think. Yeah, nearly 2,000 nearly 2,000 members and so we're very very keen to hear from you and if you go to the UFA Urban Health Section website there are details there for um, joining us on uh, the section. Um, I'd also like um, to say a huge thank you to our colleagues um, from the International um, Society of Urban Health and um, from their website, uh, you can also see um, how to join the activities, um, conferences, capacity building, and all the exciting things that are happening um, from that uh, society and how it links with multiple others. Um, I'd like to join Greg in thanking all of our speakers and it's so great um, that we were able to celebrate International Nurses Day and also top and tail the events with um, the re research for women and girls health. Um, so I'd like to thank Cathy Vaughan, Amit Fassad, Julian Skirm and Jennifer O'Brien, um, Joe Bufford and Stefano Capolongo who um, started the week off uh, at such an excellent pace with all their presentations. And then as we moved into some of the things that are taxing us um, at the moment, we had um, Dawn Dowding, Anise Eshmael, Eleanor Petalos and Michelle Briggs on Tuesday, um, really thinking about all the issues that we have, um, not only for coronavirus, but um, implementation sciences and the fact that we need to think about um, implications of um, things not only from a public health sector but also um, primary care and secondary care. Um, I know that um, we received some excellent feedback from day two, uh, sorry from day three as well and um, my huge thanks to our friend Jane South um, and Obo um, and Jill, who really galvanised the um, discussions around different uh, components of community, including um, physical health and mental health. 
Um, yesterday uh, was a fantastic day where we looked at both communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases. And I'd like to thank Cherian and Richard and Kay Marshall uh, for their input into that. And I know from looking at all of the tweets and the messaging, um, we have finished on a high. Um, so again, huge thanks to Tina, Lewis, Andrew, Scott and Yannette. Um, we hope that you'll carry on um, continuing to engage with us. We hope this isn't um, the end of um, Public Health Week, um, but the beginning of a journey together. Uh, just to point you towards some of the resources that we have available. If you'd like to know more about our free open access training program, our CPD program, or our master's programs, uh, we'd be very happy to, to take any queries that you might have. And without further ado, I'd like to thank my marvellous team um, who always shrink away whenever I try to thank them. So I've had to hijack this last meeting, but I'm now going to embarrass them by naming them. So Anjana Sahu, Omar Ali, Shirley Hannan, Margarita Kane, Hannah Waterson, Christine Greenhalge, Annie Harrison, Gary Clough, Claire Hewish, Kath Washuk, and not forgetting the mastermind of all of this uh, in um, collaboration with the University of Manchester and European Public Health Association. Our big thanks goes to Greg Williams, who has orchestrated all of the events has brought us all together and done a fabulous um, piece of work in getting this up and running in very difficult times. And my last big thank you is to you all for taking part. I hope we've empowered you that we have the ability to make a difference and things that we do now are gonna help future generations. And whilst we think of public health we must always think of our planetary health and working alongside all of the ecosystems that we're so dependent on. So thank you so much for this last week. I'm now going to hand back over to Greg um, and thank him again for all his hard work and thank you to the rest of the team. Thank you. Thanks, Abana. And yeah, I'd just like to say thanks to everybody that was listening and to all our rich speakers throughout the whole week. Um, and we will be getting these resources. They'll be staying on YouTube and we'll also be creating another resource um, for people to watch all these videos back and share some of the slides that have been uh, presented throughout the week with everybody who's registered. Um, if you were registered on Eventbrite before it, then we will just automatically send you the details of all of this. But if not, and you wish to receive some more details, then email much at manchester.ac.uk. And again, 